Defining Duke, an Xbox podcast is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support the show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Salutations, everybody. It is Maddie here today, and welcome to episode 10 of Defining Duke and Xbox podcast. And it's me, Carrick, with ACG. All right. I mean, this is our biggest episode yet, I'd, I'd have to say. I mean, it's we got. It's biggest all... and most difficult to put together. I'm still trying I know, to right? figure out my mic. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really was. We, we had to work for this episode. Yeah, this was almost ridiculous. a solo show, and we had to change our recording date. For those who don't know, and our patrons, early access got moved back a little bit. Um, it'll still go live on Thursday, just much later uh, than normal. Thanks to Dustin and Ben for moving their schedules around so that we could get this going. Uh, so it required coordination across the entire uh, Last Stand Media brand. So we appreciate your understanding. But of course, with uh, the Bethesda news finally starting to roll out, getting an idea of what's going on between Xbox and Bethesda, we wanted to make sure that uh, we didn't have any holes in our coverage, right? We could have recorded on Wednesday, but uh, we didn't want to have anything missing. And I'm glad we waited because today, Thursday, as we record this, my goodness, do we have a lot more to sift through so very exciting episode uh if you're new here just know that early access for this show goes live on thursdays like i said over on patreon.com slash last stand media if you support us there you'll get access to of course uh defining duke ultimate our bonus show that we do every week episode six for that just dropped uh it was our most comment submitted episode um more than actually our main show which is fucking insane uh we talked about backwards compatible titles that need to be added to xbox's ecosystem so that was a really fun of, th yeah that's a big subject yeah well because like, everyone writes in every week about it a ton yeah, and so yeah. i think what happened was just everyone shot their load yeah. on, on that on that episode and and now we had like 30 questions for this show on our biggest episode yet so it was pretty funny but anyway if you don't want to support the show that's fine we're happy to have you here we're available on free feeds from youtube at last stand media to uh apple google podcast spotify so on and so forth just search us up defining duke you will find our show where we're at over 330 ratings we'd like to keep pushing Ooh. that you guys slow down a little bit it's it's been in that 330 range for a, you know, a couple of weeks so i want to I want us to push again, right? I'm calling on the audience to push again. You left us short on comments, so I'm harassing you to give us some ratings. That's what's going to happen here. Every, every week I'm asking something for me from you. Uh, you'll also notice I'm wearing Defining Duke merch. The uh, Last Stand Media merch shop is a go. So if you want to go ahead and support our show or support Sacred Symbols or Knockback, uh, there's shirts, hoodies, all that good stuff. The material, I'm not even saying this because I know some people are going to be like, well, you work for Colin, of course. But the material on this shirt is actually fucking legit. Where's it's it from? Actually, uh, oh man, Dustin is, tweeted is it out. Is Stream Labs uh, or Stream? Or no, 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 it's not from, Teespring? it's like their own oh. American print thing that, uh, Dustin tweeted out who did it, but it is actually a legitimately good make. It does not feel Very crappy. Cool. Like this is an iron on this design. Like it is a legitimate good shirt, high quality stuff. So highly recommend you get yourself one if you have the expendable income or disposable income to do so. Uh, with that though, enough pimping what's going on with Last Stand. What's going on with Carrick? Uh, d trying to figure out if we could do the podcast. That was like the big <laughs> yeah, thing, right? That was really our week. <laughs> it's really tough for me to switch days lately just because of life and puppies. And like, it's me puppies here with tough. all these dogs. And even when I'll be here with Maddie, I'll be like, hey, Maddie, I got to go let the dog out during a podcast and I'll leave. And there'll be two piles of crap, three piss, you know, stains on rugs. And I got to wrap it all up it's, and shit yeah, while deflating. we're in the middle of a podcast. Yeah, it's ridiculous how much work they are. And uh, so that's honestly all I've been doing. And then, um, dude, no, that is seriously trying to figure out, like, to even get on this. Because I haven't even done a video. I did an animation video as a joke for my channel. I did a dog video. Awesome. The that animation, awesome. yeah, I'll continue yeah. to do those. Those are fun to do. Um, lost a shit ton of subscribers, by the way. Really? You know how oh, dude. Subscribers really? will give you one chance. That's it. One chance. That's it, man. Yeah, it's, I had a guy who place. He saw the and he was like, "You're fucking. This is the group think comedy cartoon shit," and just left. And I'm like, <laughs> "Wow, 
wow you can't <laughs> like i can't even have fun but i decided to double down and the next day did the dog one that's pretty much it man just jokey stuff trying to prepare there's a couple games coming up nothing big mm -hmm. outriders i guess would be the big one and um that's yeah. about it so outriders just sort of, launching at the right time I, dude it may be like it yeah it may be we'll have to see how it how it pans out but i think you're right i think this might be a good time for this one to come out yeah, it's definitely a good time for you to get a puppy, right? No games are coming out, so you got time. Yeah. I, I got mine smack dab in the middle of like travel and the three events, so I was just, I was And puppies swapped. can't be trained haphazardly, you know? No. So, yeah, so like you, it would have been hard because it's like you sort of have to be with them and then catch them when they pee or whatever. You know, you can't like yeah. randomly, right, right. So, but yours, yeah. how, how long did yours take? Do you remember how long Revan took to train? To potty train? Honest, These guys I, are rough. Uh, I want to say about eight months, really, for him to realize, oh, like, wow. wine when you got to go. Yeah, I mean, rat terriers are oh. stubborn. Oh, They're stubborn. Okay. So, you know, he, he'll be like, I, I know I'm not supposed to piss here. I am going to, though, because right. you're not going to tell me what to do. It's like, you right. little shit, go outside. You know, that type of thing. So... He's getting better now. It took him two okay. years. We we trained him consistently, um, you know, making sure we we, we were, you know, because rat terriers respond better to, to positive reinforcement. You can't just, really most dogs do, but especially rat terriers are like, right. instead of telling him, no, this is what you did wrong, you remind him of what he did good when he behaves properly and give him a treat. And so uh, that took, I, I was able to figure Even that out. Even more time though, yeah. I assume, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, because you know, you got to wait for him to do the right thing and sometimes he doesn't get that. But uh, now at two years old, uh, <laughs> it's crazy how fast time moves, but now he's got it. He's been really good. We can leave him alone at times for a couple hours and the house is not going to be fucking destroyed when we come back. So yeah. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, I lost, Pretty... I lost a brand new pair of shoes I've never worn this morning dude i heard oh, a tearing oh, oh. sound and i was sitting oh. here watching that show and i hear and i'm all there is no sound like fabric tearing there legit isn't <laughs> like you know that sound and i was like you what would he be pulling yeah and i go out there and he's got like my brand new leather shoes and he's just <laughs> fucking got him in half and i'm like oh no what were you no. gonna say though I was going to say, because you reminded me, I completely forgot. Uh, I was talking to my girlfriend about this. You know, we were talking about, she, she was talking about a pair of Vans she has. And I said, I, I remember last year, I walked in my room and I see my pair of Mickey Mouse Vans, my slip-ons, are chewed to shit. And I'm like, oh man, that's too bad. All right. These are my new dog walkers, right? Don't think much of it. Revan, yeah. about over a year old. I'm like, all right, whatever. So I throw them down the stairs right by the entrance where, you know, I can slip them on, walk the dogs whenever, you know, just nice convenient shoes, I like to call them. Uh, I end up talking to my girlfriend about this later on uh, and just found out last week that those shoes, because they were limited, uh, in my size, they go for $300 now. Right. And so yeah. I was like, yeah. I, I was like, I low key want to throw my dog out the window for a sec. Yeah. And then just catch yeah. him. No, <laughs> I know that feeling where you're just like, oh no. And then. You're just like, what, just, what can I do? Yeah. Like, I've, I've yeah. definitely started looking around the house today going, okay, some shit needs to be put up. Like, it's obvious. Mm -hmm. Dude, I, I came elevated. home first day. They chewed through my brand new wire for my Neura headphones, which is like 88 bucks. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. I was just like, Dude. okay, I got to bite my. And so I started. And why is it always the wire? Like, they can't chew. Well, he does chew the wall. Okay, admittedly that sucks, but it's a wall like like it's wood. That's okay, but like they go for your expensive shit, right? It's like they Dude. know the cost. It's like they're a really bad <laughs> housewife from those housewife TV shows where they know all the expensive shit in your house and they fucking piss on it or eat it. And yeah. you're like, "Dude, no." Yeah. Dude, <laughs> we should I make know. a game about raising puppies. Like, well, they did. What was the what was the Nintendo was, was Oh, Nintendogs. Yeah, I actually yeah. I actually played the shit out of Nintendogs. So, dude, hell yeah. As a kid, yeah. oh my god. That was a legit that game. game. Was great. Yeah, that was yeah. actually a really enjoyable game. Anyway, segue aside, yeah, dog life. Hashtag. Dog life is a hard life. With that, let's get into some more warm warm-up questions. We always pick 5 from you over on Patreon to support us there. Leave your comments, your questions, your concerns, all that stuff. I'm sure we'll have plenty from you in the coming weeks. John Garlet is our first write-in. Hello, guys. I hope you're doing unwell and all listening are having a <laughs> terrible week. <laughs> terrible. Damn. I forgot to wish everyone a, a terrible week. That I is can't true. Believe that. That, was our, that was our shtick. I, I felt my intro was empty, and I was like, I forgot to wish all of you an absolutely horrendous week. Uh, this is going to be your worst one yet. And through that hardship you will get better because you have experienced what the, the worst life has to offer and now 
now it's only up from here, right? It's rock bottom for you. With that, John writes, Last Tuesday, I picked up Immortals Phoenix Rising and was having a blast throughout the weekend. That is, until I loaded up the game on Sunday. All my manual and auto saves were overwritten for, uh, to a spot for, a, uh, for my game Tuesday, which I didn't even have a save spot for. I lost about 18 hours of progress and tried loading the game on my backup console to see if resyncing the cloud would help, but alas, Ubisoft and their save issues. Have any of y'all ever had progress lost on a game, and how did it affect you going forward? At this point, I don't want to touch the game, but I can see myself returning in a year after a long break. P.S. For others, apparently this might be due to quick resume, so absolutely force close play each time on this to be on the safe side. Uh, so thank you for that advice. Um, I've definitely had this happen once before, and at, it really wasn't... It was me being an idiot. Uh, I had this kind of OCD thing with my clearing my cache on my Xbox 360, um, yeah, where, holding the Y button, right? Yeah, 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 and and so eventually, I I I I think I pressed the wrong button and I erased my save data, and I was in the middle of of all games Hitman Absolution, which I actually was enjoying. A lot of people like to uh, crap on that game, and I know it's not really comparable to something like the current Hitman games, especially Hitman Three, which we adore here on this show. But I still liked Hitman Absolution yeah, uh, right. when I was playing it through. It was a solid game. And I was about, mm, I want to say eight, ten hours in, lost it all. All gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, never never did I return. And uh, never will I return. So, yeah, I've definitely had those ball-breaking moments where you're like, it's over. I'm not going back. I liked it, but I'm not going back. I mean, it didn't affect anything. I still talked about it positively. I remember actually many a true nerd was on the Ham Radio podcast, and he like torched me alive over over my enjoyment of the game because he like loves blood money i think it was he was like how could you say that but uh what about you do you have a a time you're i mean we've all had that i feel where, where technology has bit you in the ass yeah but i wouldn't say it's a game or a console mine's been windows prior to backups prior to knowing how to back up windows you know prior to like having online backups in particular i would say i would lose windows occasionally and it would take the c drive the documents folder and I would do that panic where I would usually reform or I wouldn't reformat the drive. I would reinstall Windows and then use a like undelete file finder and try to find a couple save games. And sometimes you would. Sometimes I'd be like, holy shit, the save game's here. But I would say it wasn't one game. It was a shit ton. Mine hasn't been corrupted that I remember. The big issue with me was quick saving at the wrong time. And one mm. of the biggest stories I had mm. was Thief. I was falling off a goddamned thing to my death and I quick saved and I had forgotten to oh. true save. And I loaded it and my friend looked over and this happened with Unreal, the not Unreal tournament, but the original single player Unreal game, the same exact thing happened. And as I fell, I saved and I remember my friend Mike sitting next to me and we both had this look on our face because he heard that button get clicked. He heard my panic <laughs> as I saved. We loaded it up and I dropped and we loaded it up and I dropped. And then I did the thing where you load it up and you push forward and you try to like mm. have it load as you're running through space. And then we just laughed. We just ended up cackling like we were like, what do you do? Like you can get mad. But then it was more of a fun thing. Right. It was more like, yeah. right. but I did not return to that for a year, I would say. Yeah, you got to have that refresher. So we understand. Sfish616 is our next write-in. Hey, guys, do you think, or what do you think, sorry, the re release order for the announced Xbox Game Studios games will be? Avowed, Fable, etc. So we have a, a set of games that we know are announced from Perfect Dark to Avowed, Fable. Uh, we imagine a new Forza game is coming, potentially Starfield's now in that mix. I would imagine it's, it's safe to assume Starfield's in that exclusive mix. Uh, so we have a lot of games coming, but none of them have a date where would you think each of these would be placed? We had the Outer Worlds in, in 2019, right? So that's Obsidian's game could fall. Do you think uh, 2023 would be a, a safe spot for them? Yeah, I mean... Maybe even sooner? I don't know. I don't even think Fable... I, like, it always feels like it's a ways off for Avowed and Fable, but that I, I it's just because I don't know their normal... It's the way they talk about it, right? I feel, I feel yeah, like I don't they know have their normal this... release schedules. In a perfect world... And I guess this is a too far fetch, but I really do think what would be amazing if they did. I mean, you'd have a back to back to back RPG thing going on here. If you had Starfield this year, I, I think Fable next year makes sense. And then Avowed the year after that. 
And then who knows about, I think it would be too soon for elders. Yeah. It'd be way too soon for elder scroll six, but you know, I, I really do think that three uh, year continuance of, of exclusives uh, would be awesome. I think Forza falls sometime in the fall. Like I, I think that's yeah pretty, pretty plausible. I don't know how they don't do that yet. I think also, unless there's a reason, I could see them doing two in one year because remember they did Bi Bioware, Bungie, and Bazaar. They did the three Bs mm. for the Xbox 360 and it was three months. It was just month after month after month. There was a huge game. It was ridiculous. If you were a 360 owner, it was it was one of the best times to be a gamer um, because it was different, huge companies in different facets of gaming releasing big games. So. It could happen. It could happen. I, I would say, I don't know about 2000. I, I think 2022, we might start seeing a couple of those big games. But I mean, they're not the only ones. You also have like, what is, uh, I mean, what's Obsidian doing? What's their timeline for game? I, yeah, I don't even know what their timeline yeah, for they're, games is. Yeah, they're not, I don't know In them. Exile like the creature might have something on the side. Oh yeah, In Exile, yeah. 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 In Exile so, with a side project makes a lot of sense. I feel yeah. like... I feel like them doing something with Fallout as a spinoff makes... Because here's the thing. I think if you do another 3D open kind of Fallout game, um, I feel that takes away from 76 and hurts it while it's growing now. Where if you do something isometric, I feel like that doesn't leech from that player base. It's it's adding to people who would want something different from that. You know what I mean? Like if you have the alternative rather than another option. Uh, I don't know how else to word it other than... It, it feels like anything in a first slash third person open world space would hurt 76, which some people will sit here and go, who cares? But I'll tell you what, Bethesda cares. <laughs> you know, the game's doing well for them. So uh, they want to keep making that 76. And you know what I would assume if it is, if it is doing well for them, my assumption is someone in Microsoft as well as Bethesda, because they did state they've been talking for years They're They've been in bed for years. There might be the idea of an expansion to 76. I could definitely see them doing that versus a like, what if they just mm. say, okay, we are going to make sure it works because remember Microsoft backed Sea of Thieves when Sea of Thieves launched with nothing. I mean, Sea of Thieves and Fallout 76, dude, Fallout 76 had its issues and it was buggy, but Sea of Thieves had nothing really. I mean, I guess Fallout yeah. 76 had nothing. You get my drift. They've yeah, both been supported mean, is what I mean. And I yeah. could definitely see Microsoft saying, hey, look at Sea of Thieves is doing well. Let's Let's continue with Fallout 76 and not worry about I, I want them to make another Fallout, though. That's just me yeah, selfishly I saying. Agree. I I want my SP Fallout. But. Yeah, everyone does. And that's the thing is, I don't know if going back to the classic formula would work for a lot of people, but I think it would introduce folks to a new style of Fallout that uh, that is underappreciated. Um, and having it kind of modernized with... with current day development would be great because you look at the older fall games and they don't play well they have great writing and storytelling but uh and the universe has this loaded up dark humor but getting in exiles take on a fallout game would be so so exciting my prediction is honestly that they're going to do some type of expansion for 76 that makes in, sense right in in, yeah. in the west um you know because the, they're all east coast there are so many hints in the in the computer terminals in that game and the notes uh talking about california and whatnot uh we haven't been to california in fallout since since really you know west coast in general since new vegas uh so if they did some type of nostalgia dip uh that would oh my gosh i mean that's what eso did to really crawl itself back into relevancy they they did skyrim then they did morrowind and then they went into oblivion this coming summer and it's worked it's kept it afloat because people like that stuff um so i i personally feel like uh, we're going to see something like that with 76. I do not be surprised if they do some type of major expansion, but I want to, I want to say they'll do more on top of that. I don't think you get those three teams that have all worked on fallout in some way underneath the same roof and say, ah, we're not, we're not doing anything with this. Like that's just, I th I almost would argue that's wasted talent, but just my, what, hands. uh, what fallout did any fallout do West? Like what's West coast fallout one and two are West coast. Um, what, where are they based in Arizona? No, that's not even West Coast. Ooh, are they based in uh, uh, California? Uh, I, know, based in... I know Fallout 2 has uh, San Francisco. Oh, uh, okay. Fallout oh, 1, okay. I'm struggling to remember where exactly. Obviously, New Vegas is like the Mojave. Um, so, yeah, there's they're, they're all West Coast yeah, Fallout true. games. Yeah, true. Of course, true. Yeah. 
I guess I'm thinking the coast coast if you get my drift. Yeah. When you yeah. say Cali, I'm thinking right up on the beach. Like oh, no. surfboard. Imagine. I don't know what's gone on with the West Coast after in Fallout. Is the ocean still in Fallout? Is the ocean still like it hasn't yeah, receded in the 200 years? Nothing weird's happened, right? So can you imagine a Fallout that had like a surf aesthetic to it and shit like that? <laughs> like the like 1950s Fallout, a, surfboards? Uh... You know, and that music there's, and stuff. There's a cool mod called Fallout Miami, and it's it's very, like, colorful, and it's on the beaches oh, of Miami. Yeah. And, and, That'd be cool. And, yeah, it, it looks great. It looks great. So that's definitely what you're talking about, and I think a lot of people would dig that because people are excited for that mod. All right. Thank you for writing in, S. Fish. Our third write-in is from David. Hi, guys. What are your memories of the Xbox One launch? Were any of the controversial features that were removed appealing to you? I, for one... Like the idea of being able to share digital games, and that was dropped. And I'm surprised developers didn't embrace or defend the original plan to have discs not be shareable since they complain about lost revenue with shared games, i.e. 100,000 people may play your game off of 500 or 50,000 purchases. Do you have any fond memories of the launch lineup or early Kinect usage? I still really, uh, still really miss saying Xbox on and Xbox record that. Mm, yeah, well, I mm. used the Xbox record that. As did I. Hmm. Yeah, I gotta be honest, Carrick. I think the best thing about Connect was Voice I don't know if Connect, you've ever right? sat on an Xbox party chat and and you like I we play Killer Instinct at launch, right? And I'd just be smoking my friends with I think her name was Syndra. And you know, just after you beat their ass, just doing the ego move of Xbox oh, record that. And they're like, yeah, All yeah. right, dude, cut it out. And so, <laughs> that was Some my games favorite would part. record when you won too. They they'd like take mm -hmm. a picture of your face when you won, which those are actually that's a sweet idea. I will say one thing I do remember is knowing somebody at a major company laughing at Microsoft because all the developers okayed Microsoft's idea for software and anti piracy. And they let Microsoft burn. They let them burn. They all knew. And they were like, when Microsoft got the, the PR backlash, they were like pretending they didn't know anything about it. All those companies <laughs> knew. Of course they knew. The fucking system was out that day. Like they knew how the games were going to be delivered. It was crazy. <laughs> well, not system. Sorry, the information. Right. Um, I remember them saying like Microsoft had told them. Microsoft's like, we'll just take the brunt on this. And uh, a lot of dev companies backed away as if they had no you know no idea they're like oh man you know you can't trade games of course they would be behind that of course they would want that yeah i i don't know for me personally when it comes to like people game sharing my game i'm not a developer but as someone who would more than likely be independent if i were to sell a game say fifty thousand purchases at 15 bucks a piece i'd be pretty thrilled even if you know, double that was through players because that's more yeah. people experiencing your thing and talking about it. And word of mouth, I think, is more valuable than uh, than really anything in this industry from like trusted sources. Uh, yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know many people who have complained about that. I've I've personally never seen that. I think more creative individuals are thrilled that people are experiencing their thing as long as it's not like I, I think what was it tiny build or whatever. Uh, there was like keys stolen and there was yeah like there a major was all the weird stuff about the yeah. keys. Moving on along, Ian Spencer is our next write-in. Carrick, I had some answers written down because I didn't know if you would be here for this show, but I'm curious to see your answer for this because it mentions a game that you adore and you talked about for probably two fucking years, Ad Nauseam. Ian writes, hey guys, just looking for some game awesome. recommendations for my girlfriend here. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> she enjoys bite-sized games that can be devoured in three to six hours, such as Oxen Free, which is one of her favorite games. She just finished Little Nightmares 1 and 2 and is moving on to Inside Next. She's an owner of Game Pass as well. I hope your week is a four out of ten slash wait for a deep, deep sale. So I have a bunch of games written down, but before I get into those, I want to I want to know what you would suggest as a Oxen Free lover. So uh, life who, is strange, who oxen it. free. Those are, sh uh, I would say, uh, I we just talked about it in the Discord. Thimbleweed Park is a point and click. I don't remember how long it is. Somebody said it was a little long. I think it's like seven hours. Um, and that's where you play like a fake agent Mulder and Scully from FBI. It's like a fake version or a weird sideways version of, of the X Files. Very fun game. Uh, also with a incredibly angry cussing clown. That game is awesome. Um, Night in the Woods, I am. I have not played Night in the Woods. However, I was just in a conversation where everybody compared it to those. So I'll say safely, most likely I would have liked those. 
Um, yeah. So Night in the Woods would be another one. These are shorter games. Uh, Dreamfall. We just talked about this. Longest Journey. That's an older game. That might be X backwards compat. I'll have to check. Um, but those are off the top of my head. Pretty much the typical ones you would expect. I don't think there's any unexpected titles for me when it comes to that. Right on. So for me, I wrote down, I had to really dig deep because at first I was thinking of games. So one I wrote was Brother Tales of a Tale of Two Sons. Mm, I know you're yeah. not a huge fan of that, but that's like a two hour game. Very quick. Uh, Plague Tale. And then I thought, Sorry. Yeah, Play, Plague Tale is great. I didn't even think of that. Yeah, Plague Tale is really good. A little bit past your three to six hour range. Yeah. But oh, yeah. I think... Yeah. Based off her taste, she'll be pretty captivated by this game. So tell her definitely give that a try. That's on Game Pass. Uh, the following games, also Gone Home was one that I really liked. That's about two, three hours. Uh, really, really great story there. Uh, just kind of a walk around the house, pick up clues, learn this mystery. Um, there's plenty of those out there. But the following games are on Game Pass. Uh, Streets of Rage 4, about three hours long. You want a, a good little beat em up uh, go ahead, pick that up. There's also River City Girls, also a beat em up on Game Pass. Fusion Frenzy, uh, just tons of mini games. Uh, a lot of people are big Mario Party fans. I love Fusion Frenzy. This is the one I grew up on where I'd get friends around the TV. We'd play this. Um, so not story-based or anything like that, but still bite-sized. You can pick it up, play it in chunks whenever you feel like it. That's on Game Pass. Uh, Spirit Fair, definitely. Uh, this seems way up her alley. Uh, this is not a super long game, you know, eight, 10 hours uh it is it is really wholesome it's got a good message to it uh, it's got some building mechanics uh and and I, I think that is probably out of all of our suggestions one of the the ones that she should go for most uh if she's looking for something old school and a little more challenging that's not long the messenger is pretty good messenger is one of my favorite 2d side scrollers it's got 8-bit 16-bit art it does a lot of time traveling stuff it is difficult mm. though um not that she can't handle that but just keep that in mind uh ori not long or oh, in the Blind yeah, Forest, yeah. or in the Will of the Wisps. Those as long are both as she's on Game also okay with being hard, right, Maddie? Yeah, Wouldn't you those consider games can be, being, yeah. The first ones, I thought the first one was pretty hard. Second one wasn't that hard. First one, though? Yeah, oh I would agree God. with that. For second one, you have weapons, so it changes the way the game plays, I think. Right, right. And I think that's because be it's better design. Like, they give you the bow and arrow where you can, like, bounce off of people or something yeah. like that. They give you some type of bounce ability. It's a lot more precise and well-controlled, so... It's a lot less difficult. Uh, Slay the Spire. She wants a roguelike, wants something replayable. Uh, it's card-based uh, deck building kind of game where you just go up the spire. Uh, you pick one of four classes. Each of them have their own builds, and, and you pick a new card to add to your deck. And, and as you diverge on paths, um, it changes the outcome of the spire itself. Uh, and then these last two fall in line with Oxen Free. Uh, they're both on Game Pass, Sea of Solitude, and Call of the Sea. So, oh, I've Call heard, of the I've, Sea is good. I've heard Sorry. really good things about Call of the Sea. No, I've heard <laughs> yeah. great things about Call of the yeah. Sea. So, I thought to myself, hey, this might be a um, this might be really good for her. So, give all of those a a look. I think you'll be uh, very pleased with uh, with at least one of these. I think I think there's a, a good selection here, and a lot of these I have played and can vouch for, but some of them I have not. Uh, Call of the Sea is one I do want to give a shot. <clears throat> I've heard a lot of good things about that. There's another one I'm going to ask Takedown as we talk here. There's another one that was a first-person game that had a Bioshock aesthetic to it that came out about a half a year ago that he streamed that he re it was like World War II and Bioshock mixed together. And it's funny because you didn't mention it, and I thought you would just because of Bioshock, you know? But it was a uh, it was like a first-person puzzler. So I'm asking him right now for the answer. So I might I might ping you that. Um Okay. As we continue uh, on, because there's another yeah, one. I'm there. trying to, I'm trying to think. That sounds really up my alley. It had the 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 starting showed like the you know the big occup uh, occupate the occupation is what it's called. Hmm. The occupation. Yeah. I've never heard of that. Hmm. All right. Number five is from Steve Forgione. Hey boys, rant incoming here. All right. So we let you guys sometimes vent on our show. Steven, it's your time. It totally could be just me, but I am so sick and tired of the whole bias in the industry in favor of Sony and Nintendo. 
All the talk surrounding Bethesda is whether or not they should make their games exclusive. Why do Sony and Nintendo fans care whether or not they get Microsoft's games too? Don't they have amazing masterpiece experiences to play? It's the same case pining for Halo Master Chief Collection. It's a non-starter in today's Xbox ecosystem where Game Pass is priority number one. Why doesn't the greater games media target Sony for their awful game uh, customer service or Nintendo for their inability to have a decent online service or improve games beyond a simple port? Microsoft has the best online service in the xbox live mm. well best online service in the terms of staying up but and download speeds uh but value wise mm. uh best backwards compatibility with future proofing updates as well as the best value in gaming with game pass ultimate but because it doesn't offer 80s nostalgia ip or sad dad stories with depressing themes it's not awesome place <laughs> to play give me a break <laughs> as someone who's fortunate to own all three systems i find myself in xbox ecosystem the most only using sony and nintendo for various exclusives at least in nintendo's case their games are pretty much events that you can share with others am i off the mark here sick of games media treating xbox players like second class citizens while also wanting xbox games on competing platforms hopefully we have an answer by thursday on what they're doing with bethesda so we can just stop hearing about it anywho rant over games are awesome keep up the great work now at first i thought your rant was misplaced but at the end as you round it up a little bit where you mentioned how uh you're tired of of the discussion of xbox being on competing platforms i think this is really because of how phil spencer has spoken on multiple occasions he's created the expectation uh with likes of ori and to some extent not locking down cuphead which i think was still a mistake i don't know if that was an option they could have pursued um but letting those games go to say nintendo uh being open to game pass on nintendo um those types of things kind of kicked down the door and i think what happened was you had the wording get misplaced so when 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 Phil was saying, hey, we want to get Game Pass everywhere, he's talking about TV, phones, right? The more accessible things where uh, I don't want to sound like the guy from from uh, Blizzard, but, you know, most people have phones. Most people have TVs. Uh, not everyone can afford, say, a new console. But if you had Game Pass on your smart TV, uh, you know, a TV can be used for multiple things, right? So it's it's one of those things where I feel like that is where xbox is leaning when they say hey we want to get these on as many uh in as many players hands as possible uh accessible through all means but playstation is how i received it but i think the media kind of carried it in a different direction where they started toying with the idea of hey gears on on playstation halo on playstation and i still do think that is possible because we saw xbox now bring these games uh halo i mean to pc and i wonder if halo's been around long enough where they can say hey let's let's take master chief collection to switch I feel, like, I feel like Switch is the good in-betweener. You probably piss a lot of people off who are hardcore Xbox fans if you if you bring Halo to, to PlayStation that's like Uncharted coming to Xbox. And I don't I don't know. But uh what do you make of this rant, Carrick? I mean, is there is there anything here for you to to dig your teeth into? Um no, I mean I would say that if you get any in industry, like automotive industry, this comes up, like BMW versus, you know, Porsche. I just had this conversation with somebody. You you get it whenever there's like competition of competing platforms. I will say that people have a tendency to reward what has been delivered to them successfully. And so when people back up Sony, it's because for the longest period of time, they feel Sony's paid them back and for their, for their fandom, which I wouldn't disagree with. I will say that understanding that Sony and Nintendo both screwed each other over and that's why you're playing a PlayStation. You sh like, how long are you going to hold your hate? Because if, yeah. You're going to be like, hey, these companies do bad things. I hate Microsoft. Then I'll just go back at you and be like, well, guess what? I'm old enough to hate Sony because they've done horrible stuff too. Boom, we're done. At some point, you're not playing games. Now you're just arguing semantics and it's it's pretty stupid. Mm -hmm. So I get yeah, his rant, well, but I would also say that um, while they're ranting, you should be playing. And to me, that's what I would do. Like, I will. OK, I love to honeypot Twitter, like admittedly. 50% of my Twitter posts are there to see who I can make mad on one side and the other to see like I admit that I do a lot of times I'm realistic on stuff but I do like to honeypot people but um, I just think Sony fans that's just they're verbal because they have great games too. Microsoft may have a lot of titles and Bethesda titles but I'm going to tell you a lot of the people by the way I've checked on this a lot of the people decrying Bethesda going to Microsoft absolutely hammer on skyrim and fallout and 
So that's when it does feel disingenuous. It's just like you're you not even you don't sound like you even think those games are good. So why? Oh, well, I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like gatekeeping. Well, how long ago? Especially because like these two companies, one thing I do want to point out, I hear gatekeeping a lot. People don't understand how gatekeeping works. Gatekeeping, Microsoft has already stated every single thing that was being created for multi-plats will be multi-plat. They made that clear today. They said, you know, those things we're working on. Anything after that is quite literally not gatekeeping because it is now created under a Microsoft Bethesda umbrella and you don't know if it will be good or bad and it's created in that ecosystem, not in Bethesda standing alone and their ecosystem. That is not gatekeeping. It's quite literally not possible to be a gatekeep because you just moved the stadium you are supposedly gatekeeping from. That makes no sense. You cannot gatekeep that. And factually, you can't. So that's the one thing I would say is that if you're going to use gatekeeping as your excuse for this kind of stuff, you probably need to use a different word because that's not what we're getting at. Um, and the rest, who gives a shit? Argue it for a bit and move on. Play your games. Like, who gives yeah. a shit? I mean, right? I agree. Be, dude, there's thousands of indies, Maddie. Ori, indie t team, Cuphead, indie team. They could be the new, not Bethesda, but you get my drift. They could be one of the many companies working for Dude, Bethesda. Making the Sony new Ninja can... Turtle game, all indie. That's one of the biggest IP. <laughs> Dude, Ins Insomniac does great stuff. Uh, Guerrilla Games, by the way, great stuff. And some of these companies weren't with Sony, and then Sony got them. Nintendo does this less. I don't know if you agree, but I don't. You don't hear about Nintendo buying shit very often. Now they bought, they I, bought one company that they were like in partnership with for a while. And I'm talking like they did Super Mario Strikers together and Right. So I think Luigi's his rant Mansion, is wrong so. in that in that part because I just don't hear even back in Sega yeah. Nintendo days, you really didn't hear that very much. You just heard that Nintendo was a bully with money, which they were. Yeah. Yeah, I um, yeah, Nintendo. I I wouldn't really bring into it. Other than his point was that they make shitty ports, and and I would a hundred percent agree with ports. that. Shitty ports. In what way? By shitty ports, oh. I mean that low effort. And I, you you know how I stand on it. Like when you are content and not pushing for more, I arguably hate your stuff more. What so with something like Skyward Sword or uh the the Mario 3D All Stars where they don't do really much with them. I'm not talking go oh, in and, and dig through the game. From, and... game from their own system to their own yeah. system. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Very low yeah. effort. And right. it's yeah. really, it's going to sound like someone's going to say, oh, you're you're just an Xbox fanboy. Fuck off. Uh, it's really that Xbox's backwards compatible program shines a spotlight on how horrendous Nintendo is behaving with their ports, where we just learned today that they're going to give Morrowind oblivion 60 fps or the fps boost on xbox and you know i gotta say when you look at that with it running at 4k like something like oblivion running at 4k 60 fps i mean that is that's awesome and you don't have to pay a dime for that you have to just have the game the old game that you bought and i think when nintendo's kind of upscaling the game and selling it for 60 bucks that's a joke and and i do think more people I need to hold them accountable saying. yeah i see what you're saying yeah, yeah so. it would be the same way if Master Chief had come out and wasn't graphically improved, Master Chief Collection. Mm -hmm. Then, I mean, I think even more people... Remember when Master... What was the one that came out? The Xbox Halo 1, uh, it was the redo. What was that thing called? Where oh, graphics... Combat push the button. Evolves Anniversary, I think. Anniver Dude! That's awesome. right there is a port. Like, that's yeah, when you're that like, awesome. like... That's when you're all, oh, shit, that's amazing. So, yeah, yeah. I get it. I get that complaint. With that, though, that transitions perfectly into uh, number one for our news. It's official. After months of waiting, Xbox is now in ownership of Bethesda and their portfolio of studios. The acquisition adds eight teams, Arcane, Tango, Gameworks, Bethesda, Game Studios, id Software, Machine Games, ZeniMax, Online Studios, Alpha Dog, and Roundhouse Studio, bringing Keep the going. total of first-party studios gotcha, under Xbox to a staggering 23. In a write-up on Xbox Wire, Phil Spencer delicately threaded the needle, saying, quote, This is the next step in building an industry-leading first-party studios team, a commitment we have to our Xbox community. With the addition of the Bethesda creative teams, gamers should know that Xbox consoles, PC, 
and Game Pass. Note in this write up here, and we'll talk about what Phil said afterwards, that he labeled Game Pass as a platform. So just keep that in mind. Anyway, and Game Pass will be the best place to experience the new Bethesda games, including some new titles in the future that will be exclusive to Xbox and PC players, end quote. So right there, we're not stopping. We still got a little bit more to read through, but just note that he's talking that there will be exclusives in the future. We'll talk about what exactly that means. His post continues, quote, as we shared previously, it's vitally important that Bethesda continues to make games the way it always has. We look forward to empowering Bethesda's creative teams to reach even more players around the globe, helping make future Xbox, I'm sorry, future Bethesda titles, the biggest and most popular games in their history. Xbox and Bethesda have shared a common vision for the future of gaming, both as fans and as creators, Bethesda understands the potential of Xbox Game Pass. Now, I've made a video about this, this part right here, really important to emphasize once again, as we read along here, because when people were reading this at first, they were saying, you know, we want to have Bethesda continue to make the games the way they do. And people were saying, oh, they're going to do PlayStation more. That makes sense. Um, There's not going to be interference on their PlayStation stuff, which I think for the most part, there won't be. Uh, But with that said, Bethesda understanding the potential of Game Pass after all that is said, I think Phil was getting a little tongue in cheek there and and trying to indicate what he was really hinting at in the terms of making sure uh, Bethesda games remained as accessible as possible. Uh, Lastly, he commemorates uh, Robert Altman, the founder of ZeniMax, whom he worked directly with for multiple years, saying, quote, I will miss the opportunity to work with him on the future uh, of our combined teams, but I know that his spirit will live on in the shared work we do and motivate us to make this partnership all he envisioned, end quote. Phil ends this post by saying, quote, in the meantime, to properly celebrate this special moment, we are bringing additional Bethesda games to Xbox Game Pass later this week. Stay tuned for more details. So then, afterwards, on Thursday, today, March 11th, as we record this podcast, Xbox and Bethesda joined together for a panel of sorts to discuss the meaning behind this partnership. Now, there were additional comments and exclusivity. They have confirmed that 20 Bethesda games are coming to Game Pass tomorrow, Friday, March 12th. So that adds an insane amount of value. We just talked, I think, was it last week or the week before? that they added all these sports games in the week before there was a ton more games added. We saw Desperados three and we saw control get added. They just continue to pile on the value for game pass during this panel, which is worth listening to, by the way, um, it's about an hour long. It's just kind of a bunch of faces from Bethesda that you're familiar with, like Todd Howard and Pete Hines. There was also Aaron Losey there. Aaron Greenberg was there. Uh, Phil Spencer was, um, and as well as Sarah Bond, and they continued to cycle in faces throughout Bethesda. Um, but what was important were some of the notes they made. While they said there wasn't going to be reveals or news at this event, there was plenty of news, plenty of teases at that Uh, One of them is that they said that Bethesda and Xbox are starting to work together now and plan for the future. So this indicates that they were not operating independently like I had personally speculated. More importantly for all of you is Phil directly confronting the conversation on exclusive. He said, I know a lot of people were asking. We understand people want to know more. We could not say more though. Uh, So he said that he can't say every single Xbox game or Bethesda game will be exclusive, citing things like contractual obligations. This was most likely in reference to the likes of, say, Ghostwire Tokyo or Deathloop, games that are on PlayStation contractually. They are obligated to release those games there. We have yet to see if they're going to work around it and do PC Game Pass for those titles. I'm not sure if there's a loophole there. But he also mentioned things like legacy content uh, that they could put onto other systems. But his exact quote which I think was probably the most significant one of them all, was, quote, if you're an Xbox customer, the thing I want you to know is this is about delivering great exclusive games for you that ship on platforms where Game Pass exists, and that's our goal, end quote. Um, Now, not to suck up all the conversation here, but I think that's a good starter, and we'll get into a little bit more of what was said here, but I think that there is a really powerful position to be in, right? Because he's not talking about Xbox. He says, the ship on platforms where Game Pass exists. Character, does that not put PlayStation in a position where it's like, you can have Bethesda games if you let us put Game Pass there? Well, yeah, it's just like they said, we have no issues with crossplay. That was it. And everybody was like, well, then it must be Sony who's had issues with crossplay. Like, Microsoft has a tendency to drop the boat on that, where, like, in a conversation where somebody's like, well, not all of us in the room are dumb, but there's only you and one other person. And you're like, wait. 
that means I have to de facto be the one that's dumb. Microsoft does that. It's obviously what they meant, but I, I don't think people realize that the big thing, so there, there's a reason why Microsoft announced the Samsung um, combination work as well as LG. Samsung in particular, where Game Pass possibly might be on a Samsung device, um, but they're already got tie-in with HDR, auto HDR, and all kinds of settings. Game Pass is the thing. And so they'll just put it on everything and then they'll just let Sony decide at some point. And I bet you somebody was like, oh, Microsoft wouldn't do that. Dude, of course they, they would. would. And the reason why is the streaming de facto is not as good as local hardware. We know that. We all know that there's little leg issues. That's not what Microsoft is pushing as their primary. So to put their secondary on a PlayStation system and say, eh, if you want to try them out on PlayStation, it's only positives for them. However, will it happen? No. Sony has, Sony is so anti, they're just so anti. It just won't happen. It, it would be, it will I take a long them, time. Right? I don't blame them. I don't them, either, but... but even since Nintendo's hmm. days with the PlayStation and the Super SNES CD and how the PlayStation came to be, they, I don't know if any big company wants to get in bed with Sony, to be honest, because they're a little like Nvidia where you always feel like something weird is going on on the back end. Hmm. So, yeah. It is what it is. Wherever Game Pass can be played, that's where you'll be yeah. playing these. Yeah, and I found that very interesting. This is the biggest acquisition we've really seen in gaming history that I can recall yeah. in the terms of money yeah. and studio yeah. acquisitions and, and how much is coming in there. The fact that Phil said not Xbox platforms or Windows or Microsoft no. platforms, but he said where Game Pass exists, I think that indicates very strongly where their head is at for the future where their head is at for all these acquisitions. It's why Sega makes a lot more sense than the rumors we heard about Techland. Not to dive into that, right? We want to focus this on Bethesda. But what you see here is that now every Bethesda game previously and future will permanently be on Game Pass because they own them, just like all of their other first-party studios. So while there is an exciting rotation of content, like I just mentioned earlier from sports games, where maybe you don't want to pay annually. Now you got sports games on Game Pass uh, yeah. where you have control. Maybe you skipped out on that. Now you can play that with all of its next-gen upgrades. That's great. But something like Sega getting that in there, that's another huge catalog of titles that just stick there, right? The rotations are great. That's exciting. That's the juice that keeps you invested. But having a stable of exclusives and content that will always be there from Dishonored to Doom to Elder Scrolls, Fallout, The Evil Within, to just have all of those there on top of Gears, Halo, Ori. I mean, that's something, man, right? Like that alone, the thing is, is normally... I've seen people say, I will buy in now because this got added. But now Game Pass is making the argument where you want to stick or you want to buy in just based off what is already there baked in. You can hop to any of these games whenever you want. And I think that's something that's valuable. And I would not be surprised to see Microsoft make at least one more really aggressive move to really bolster the offering of Game Pass. Like if it's not acquisition, like I do think, and we'll talk about Sega in a little bit, but I do think they're going to team up with them in some way. I think... There's some writing on the wall with that. But with that, you can tell by Phil's wording, there's something really special to him about Game Pass, which is clear. And that is where uh, the future really lies. Um, now, what do you make of, of, I mean, Carrick, do we boast a little bit here? I think we have an, I think we deserve this, right? We've gone oh, wow. through about oh. half a year of, of being told, no, it's not happening. There are no exclusives. No way they do that. I think you mentioned in you know, your four stages of grief, denial was in, in in progress. What's the temperature on this right now? How are you feeling? We were correct. Yeah, I mean, I I all shout out the sources, a couple sources I know um, that have been impeccable for like lately, which is nice because there's a lack of anxiety on my part now with saying stuff or not saying stuff. Um, this one in particular, there was no anxiety because this is what I had been informed, like for sure was happening. But it's mm -hmm. nice to have the source be right, because sometimes sources are weird. And then, like you said, sometimes you're just looking at what people have said or haven't said. Like, what did he not say? OK, well, that might mean this. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's nice. But at the same time, um, you know, especially for, you know, some of mine's guesswork. Some of mine is definitely, you know, information. It's. I think it's nice to be done, to be honest. 
I get really tired of the back and forth where like you do know something and somebody's trying, they're calling you names or they're getting mad and you're like, that's not what's actually happening. You know, like you're actually factually wrong. And then like, prove me wrong. And you're like, no, they'll prove you wrong. But you know, you know, it'll be a month down the road before somebody gets proven wrong. That can be a little rough on Twitter or like on a YouTube when you happen to mention something during a comment, mm -hmm. you know, like we see that with our comments in the podcast where you'll say something and we'll say something and somebody will be like, you guys are fucking wrong. And you'd be like, I factually know I'm not <laughs> wrong. But at the same time, you're, you know, you don't want to throw your source under the, you know, under the bridge, of course. sort of speak. But <clears throat> yeah, so for I have me, to say it was a major, him. for sure. For me, it was a major exhale, like not because I knew I was right. That's the thing. I didn't have a, a source. I, I've had sources for other things that I've mentioned on this show. But when it came to the whole exclusive thing for me, it was just general deductions based off their wording and where they were trending and how it just I don't know what planet people lived on where they thought that the money spent would just make things not exclusive. Not it's never happened that, before. In yeah, history, it wouldn't. In gaming. It would not make any sense that they were yeah. just like things are going to stay the same. Um, yeah. It's also that now we see the wording has changed in the way of how direct they are being about things, and I'm glad they're just pulling the band aid off because people are going yeah, right. to bitch no matter what. That's fine. I get it. Right? Like I'm not going to sit here and puff my chest out to PlayStation fans uh, because at the end of the day, I want everyone to experience it. But I think the reality is, is th that people are confused. Why are our folks celebrating Bethesda? going to xbox versus if playstation got another studio would that celebration be the same and there's going to be a lot of well, i don't get it the reason really for that is because at its core the reality is xbox exclusives are far more easier to access than anything playstation does when you want a playstation exclusive you buy that one console that is it and then you can wait years for it to get ported days gone after two years got put on pc um same thing with horizon took three years actually for that um so or actually was days gone two years i think it was that 2019? days gone was i think days gone was two yeah okay yeah. okay i was just making sure point being is the reality there you got to wait to get those exclusives if you want to go on another platform so you have to buy into a console that's very hard to find where xbox is working right now to have xbox pc phones smart tv apps and who knows who embraces the the game pass app we really hope that Nintendo maybe is one of those that through xCloud streaming, they find a way to embrace Game Pass. That would be amazing to see. And so the reality is that, yes, it is locked yeah. off in a sense. No one's going to lie to you about that, but it is not as heavily locked off or inaccessible. And not only that, but Xbox has kind of created this value package where let's say you want to get the Series S, a system that a lot of people in our audience really dig. Okay. You can do the Xbox all access plan, 20 bucks a month which is a lot more affordable than dropping 400, 300 right off the bat. Some people don't have that disposable income, which makes sense. You want that new game that just came out. You don't got to spend 70, you spend 15 that month. Maybe you get it down the line when you have extra money. There's something there that makes it a lot more digestible that people are either actively fucking ignoring um, and just coding it with a pain of fanboyism and saying, well, that's what it is. Or it's, it's, it's intentionally missing the point like you and I have really talked about. And so... For me, I, I just find it perplexing when folks get really wrapped up. And why are you happy about this? It's, it's because historically Bethesda and Xbox have done their best content together. I think that's a fact. Like yeah. starting with Morrowind and looking at Oblivion for its time. Good Lord. Um, and then you look at Fallout Skyrim 3. Skyrim had all kinds Skyrim. of issues. They, yeah. Yeah. They just overall yeah. have, I mean, they've stated it. You could tell in the meeting by even that that weird sit down, that was weird because most companies don't have just a sit down and they, you can tell they've talked a lot. Like there's yeah. something like it does. Honestly, here's the thing, you know, Sony was trying to buy out the Starfield exclusivity. We know that for a fact. Mm -hmm. And yep. so you could have either had the exclusivity be on one system that, you know, or now you have it on a couple, maybe I've got your PC. Like, I mean, maybe we're looking at the devil in the details kind of thing. I don't know. I just, to me, it's it's done. You got your yeah, stages of grief. You're going to have to fucking work through them, people, because it's done. <laughs> it's the same thing I would have had. I, I If I only owned the Xbox, I would have done with Spider-Man as well as what's the other game Insomniac does um, that you like? Ratchet, um, Ratchet and Clank. Yeah, but there's another one. The one, the Sunset big Sunshine. Sunset Overdrive. Sunset Overdrive. Oh, yeah. Right? And Ratchet and Clank, by the way, which is weirdly enough now climbing up my ladder of like great games. 
that oh, won't dude. be on something Fuck else, out. right? I so love you're, retro, yeah. And it, admittedly, you might even say Odd World is a little like that because it seems like they love working with PS4 uh, and mm-hmm. Sony. So yeah, yeah, it sucks uh, that that Xbox isn't getting Odd World because Munch's Odyssey was exclusive back when the system launched. Stranger's Wrath, remember? Stranger's yeah, Wrath was exclusive, dude. dude they yeah. he and he doesn't. I mean, uh, you probably you may know more than me, but every time I hear him talking about that deal, he ain't happy. So whoever no, screwed him over Warren at Microsoft, like that. <laughs> someone painted, did him dirty, <laughs> painted him dirty. Yeah. And he's not like, yeah. I think that's forever. I, I it just listening to him talk. I'm like, man, that guy ain't coming back. You know, he's like, I, I don't mm-hmm. think that dude's showing back up again for the party. No, man. And so, yeah, it's, I agree entirely. You put it perfectly that, you know, it's, it's, going to be the nature of our industry moving forward right you know there's going to be times where xbox is going to is going to lose out on on a game that that we wish they had and that's fine i guess the difference is uh bethesda existed in a third party capacity for a super super long time looking into the future a little bit they also teased that bethesda and xbox will be having some type of summer showcase together which i think was to be expected but um the report was that uh, we would have Xbox on one day and then Bethesda the day right. after. That's what I had heard, too. It doesn't sound like that, though, unless yeah, it's two right? full days, right? Or or something, because uh, I thought they said together. I really think it depends on two things. How much Bethesda has, and this may sound like the same thing, but I'll explain, and if Starfield is ready to show. Because if Starfield is ready, I don't see Todd slotting his trailer in for two minutes and be like, all right, thanks for squeezing me in, Microsoft. When has this guy hit the stage and not been there for a half hour, right? Like he, he loves being there. He loves talking about it, explaining everything. He gets memed to fucking death and he leaves. And so, you know, I feel like if that's going to happen, then Bethesda will do something separately. Uh, The other thing is if they have enough to justify their own showcase. Um, Looking now this year, they have a lot of games coming out. They have Ghostwire Tokyo coming out in the fall. We haven't heard much of Wolfenstein 3. We're assuming Starfield will be there. You know, there are plenty of other games coming around. We don't know what Roundhouse Studios is working on. I think Alpha Dog, I want to say, is a mobile game studio. It is mobile. Um, yeah, so I, I assume that them and maybe Bethesda Game Studios Montreal are tinkering on something mobile for Starfield because it's a new universe. It would be really cool if they had a mobile companion app, sort like of like Fallout, Fallout Shelter. Uh, Shelter. Yeah, yeah, bring you into I, that a little bit. So I, I feel like... Yeah, right. I feel like they have Bethesda conferences work if they have enough, like any showcase. We've seen EA, Ubisoft, Bethesda all overextend themselves and try to make shows that don't need to exist and waste a lot of time and money uh, making it so. Um, So I feel like this year, also ZeniMax Online Studios, I feel like they're going to finally show whatever their new MMO is. That's just a prediction of mine. I don't know for sure. No sources have told me that. That is just my general assumption of that. Um, just based off how long they've been working on ESO, they got a new chapter coming out soon with Oblivion. Uh, the Gates of Oblivion was is what yeah, it's I called. Saw that. Yeah, which looks good. And uh, I've actually recently got back into that game. It's a pretty good time. My girlfriend and Every, I have been playing it. So crazy. Everybody, at least I'm hearing everybody's getting back into it. And it's on Game Pass. So if anyone wants to try it, it's a long download though. Really fucking long download. So. <laughs> prepare yourself longer than you'll play the game no i'm just joking. yeah I'm honestly <laughs> but uh, yeah it, it, it's just um oh i did want to say man. one thing about the meeting uh did you realize so i was looking at how many staff they have how many staff mm-hmm. all of zenimax Bethet, or all those guys have and then all microsoft has and then all their ips technically bethesda has more to show than microsoft ever would possibly have to show in a show hmm. So the hardware creator, which is unlike Sony, well, Sony buys company and then sort of like merges them in over the decades. So that could happen here. But the reason why I think they're doing it together is Microsoft can be like, come to the Microsoft show. Bethesda can be like, come to the Bethesda Microsoft show. And suddenly you've got this. I mean, I wouldn't even be surprised if it's named something like, you know, Microthesda or whatever as a joke because people <laughs> don't realize if you watched that there was a couple things i noticed about the way the speaking pattern was first bethesda started talking not microsoft did you notice that the announcer was what's his name uh pete, ta- yeah. uh, pete hines not phil that's a big deal it was yeah not... i was actually now you mentioned it i was kind of surprised here's that. another thing the two errands had an argument about an argument well, it, did you notice that? 
She's yeah, like, yeah. She's like, and I told you, blah blah blah. And he's like, no, you did. Yeah. My opinion is most likely Bethesda and Microsoft for a long time have been talking about this, and also are very, very belligerent to one another that it stays. What Bethesda gets out of it is hardware knowledge in the 10 year plan, which Phil made clear is highly useful. In fact, if a company just like Guerrilla Games knows where Sony's going, huge boon to them. Now Bethesda and everyone below them now knows where Microsoft is going. But I did notice the old, yeah, we, I, I told you and, and Aaron, what's his name? I can't remember his name, but the guy from Microsoft was like, no, no, you did. And I was all, that's a odd, it's oddly, um, it's almost like an antagonistic, not in a bad way. I want to make sure people aren't reading this wrong, but there's, there's some business partners that you know where they're, they, they may not be best friends. In fact, the two doctors for BioWare, they were doctors, but they weren't like best buddies, nor mm -hmm. are they both brewing beer together anymore. But together they made something incredibly special because they were okay with telling each other that's wrong. And sh if you notice, she said, she's like, I told you that was wrong. And you're like, mm -hmm. have you ever heard a developer on a stage floor say we told Sony they were wrong? Or Nintendo, or even Microsoft in the past. I think <laughs> no, that's I noticed the one that big thing here. That was that, in my notes. Mean, I was going to bring that up. I oh, thought sorry. it was really sorry. no, 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 no. It's good. You, I was. It was going to be the next thing I mentioned was like kind of their their relationship together. You can kind of see how they were behaving. They've Two talked big a lot. Wigs, not yeah. one in charge. You know. Yeah. It was because uh, they 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 the way she worded it was Aaron who said it. she she said yeah we uh, we tell it as it is. And I mean, I've interacted with Bethesda before on many occasions and they do. They do, man. Like I remember, uh, I won't get into details, but I remember one time I like had a video that like I was trying to figure out how to do this video interview and you couldn't post the exact audio from it. And I did this work around. They were like, we don't like this. And I was like, oh shit. You know, so. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Which, that's, no, that's here's the thing. Direct. Not, no a, not a bad problem. thing. Not a bad thing. No, the, no, no. Me and Carrick have been like very it. vocal on shows before. I like when a company tells me if I'm working with them on something, we don't like this or we do like this. Some people can't swallow that. I'm okay with it. I would, I want that transparency. I want to put out shit, right? So they're like this no, like, don't do that. And it helps. It helps. Yeah. Honestly, who knows what people would have, how people would have responded uh, to the video if it went out that way. Uh, so it's one of those things where, you know, I, I believe that. And, um, you know, they're very real people. I've, I've shared uh, this story before, but just I think it's relevant to this conversation. So I'll share it again. I remember at the Fallout 76 preview event, um, you know, we were there, there was like a whole dinner thing planned for once the demos were done. And uh, I recall Pete Hines, you know, he invited me to sit down at the table with him and a bunch of definitely higher ups at Bethesda to just talk. And um, there wasn't any business going on, it, but it was just like, dude, I'm I'm a YouTuber. So uh they're very much human at Bethesda, which I've, it's one thing I've always appreciated about them. And I feel like one thing that left me jaded with them was over the years, starting with uh, really like Fallout 76, I felt they stepped away from that a lot um, because they were constantly, they looked like they were, they were trying to cover their own tracks behind them, make sure they didn't fuck up. And in turn, they were fucking up kind of like we see a lot of companies do CD project red being the most recent example. Uh, but yeah, I just, there's something humanizing about saying like, uh, Hey, why don't you come sit down with us? and getting getting to know everybody there uh that was really cool so um you know that may sound like i have some bias towards them or whatever and, and fine make your own conclusions but to me it's more so that when she said on stage we tell it as it is and they had that moment on stage and i've had my own personal experiences um it does seem that would continue to be the case for them and i haven't seen that with bethesda uh but i assume it's true because i told you like i'm not i was not a fan of, of howard on twitter at all we, you know, remember when I first started on your podcast, I was, uh, or sorry, Pete Hines. Oh, oh, oh. I was like, Todd, remember, I, so I like, apologize. What? Remember when I started on your <laughs> yeah. podcast, I was like, nah, nah, nah. What yep. I think I was picking up on is if two people, if people are individuals, they're not always going to gel. It's not the PR. They're, they're not trying to gel. And so some mm -hmm. of the stuff he was saying, I was like, dude, what the fuck? And, and sure. Some of it was PR, but some of it was probably just him coming through. One of the things I've dealt with was Microsoft though is also that way because there was one thing I did for Microsoft and they let me know. And I was all, and I got contacted by devs who were like, 
no, 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 no. Let's talk about this. And they let my review stand, <laughs> but they did. They and I can talk about this now, but it was a huge game of theirs that I liked, but I dinged one particular element in hard and my inbox. It was like it went live and my inbox was like, but ding, you want to talk? And I was like, and I looked and I'm all, who the fuck is this? And I looked him up and they're like, please don't tell anybody. You know, they, like, it'd be great if you didn't share this, but I want to explain to you why you saw the things you saw, just so you understand mm. if you talk about it later. And I was, that was a, that was pretty, dude, nobody does. I mean, I, it, Sony has done, Sony did that with the PS5 dramatically. They reached out to me. Of course, I'm a bigger YouTuber, but when I had PS5 issues, they didn't treat me with kid gloves. They actually wanted to figure out the issue, which was really cool. You know, they were like, are you sure yeah. you're, you're not an idiot? Which is the first thing you should do. Turn it off and back on. So not all right, right. not all companies don't do it, but it's pretty rare. It's pretty rare that they yeah. they're that sort of forward about stuff. Let's hope it doesn't yeah. cause an issue later. I don't think <laughs> yeah. it will. Uh, you know, let's hope they can get along. But yeah, yeah. Watch them be forward and they'll be like, "Yo, this show sucks." <laughs> no, suck. I just mean, what if? What if? Oh, like, you mean they, between them? My bad. Yeah, like the two errands because they were like blah 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 blah. Which, by the way, I've had antagonistic relationships that were really um far more antagonistic than that by the way very that were very still fruitful and i could still work with the person so i don't want to i don't want anybody to think i think that's even a millionth as antagonistic as normal businesses go it was just more mm -hmm. of the jibing the jabbing the like and i'm like get your ding in on, on a public yeah, stage right <laughs> right it, it, it would be like me and you but with less laughter and like actual pointed stuff because you and i will be like dude battlefront or whatever but like we get it and there's nothing really pointed about it. That was a little point, not in a bad way. It's just keep an eye on it. Cause I think that could be really useful for a big company to have another big company work for them and be like, no dude, no. And by the way, Epic did the same thing with Microsoft with the 360. I don't know if you remember that, but Cliff Bozinski got them to put the extra Ram in the 360. It was going to have 256 mm -hmm. and they were like, no, we'll show you a level with 256 mem and we'll show you a level with 512 and they showed him and while he was on a, a plane he got a dm saying you're right we're wrong we'll put 500 we'll lose money you're like you're right wow. we'll, we'll take the go. hit yeah so pretty cool stuff when you think about it yeah jake williams wrote in about this very topic hey defining duke i found that interesting by the way jake he didn't pluralize it he said hey defining duke he said hi to our show. That's us. Not us. Yeah, hi show. Uh, hi show. Uh, Those show. guys, not so much, but hi yeah. show. Microsoft has finished the Bethesda deal and has said that some games going forward will be exclusively for Xbox and PC. Xbox has been pushing the idea of, quote, play anywhere on anything, end quote, for a while now, and cutting off a huge section of the market seems against that message, especially if they choose to make some sequels like Wolfenstein 3 or Doom 3 exclusive and not allow PlayStation players to finish those stories without an Xbox or Game Pass subscription. Should Microsoft be worried about backlash from the gaming community for not allowing PlayStation players the opportunity opportunity to play certain bethesda games thanks for the awesome podcast so i thought this was a really good question because um they like i said the the pr based off the rant that we had uh in our, our fifth question in the welcome section um which is is about how phil spencer has talked a certain way do we feel he's not walking that same walk all of a sudden now that we are locking down a section of the market and, and i i think the most important point to make just to emphasize before you give your thoughts is jake is seemingly talking about the likes of sequels games that um were, were, were around for a while and we've got to experience some of their stories like wolfenstein 3 i think is more relevant as a, a story that's going to be wrapped up um i'll just say for me i think of final fantasy 7 every time now we haven't had any indication that it's not coming to xbox but we we have no idea when that will happen and I view Final Fantasy VII as one of the most legendary RPGs of all time. It's one of the most popular. It's one of the most well-known. It's one of the best-selling. It's it's one of the biggest names out there. And they locked down the remake for that, something that I imagine everybody would want to experience, uh, they being PlayStation. And I'm not saying, well, they did it, so why don't we? But I feel if something like that can be locked down, then any sequel is really open to being locked down. But what do you make of um, Xbox kind of, I don't want to say going against what they did, because I feel like that's a little dramatic to suggest, because uh, they do own them and they should operate in that capacity. 
Um, but what do you what do you make of what Phil said and what they're doing now? Which I know we dabbled in a little bit, but yeah, and there's, this question there's Final anything. Fantasy 14, the MMO, right? Yeah. Also not on Xbox, and even say, stated they oh, were yeah, probably we not going that. to. Yeah. yeah, you mentioned that to me last two podcasts ago. So you have Final Fantasy, but you also start looking at Odd World, ty- ty- you know, where like who's made what deal for them to just do PlayStation. There's all kinds of stuff, and it's Bethesda. So I'm assuming what people are really asking about is the three main ones, which would be your Wolfenstein, your Skyrim, and your Fallout. Like, that's th- those are the main ones people are talking about, because I don't know how you many don't people... Think Doom? Hmm. Yeah, Doom... Doom's a PC... So, so that one is interesting, because I still think that most likely Doom is majorly uh, consumed on the PC. I could be wrong, but as a speed first-person shooter, I, I haven't seen yeah. the sales. But I will say one thing. People are dramatically messed up dramatically messed up when they are assuming titles where they sell and where they make money and that like a company can't make it back you'll see somebody be like oh they're 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 not selling on this one title and you'll find out 200,000 games sold 200,000 versions sold on one platform 300,000 on another let's say let's say it's even half let's say it's 500,000 of a title sold on one platform 250,000 sold on another so you move forward and now you have exclusivity most likely what you're going to have is another half. So you'll have about 350 to 400,000 sold on the one new exclusive platform. And then the rest either won't play it or they'll play it on PC or they'll play it on some other mm-hmm. device. So people, and, and then, and then of course you have the fact that an entire development team has to work on a port, um, which costs a tremendous amount of money as well. So uh, none of this really, I think answers this question other than to say, um, it hasn't stopped anybody else and start again. I'll return to Starfield, though. It's not a sequel. Once you find out Sony was shopping exclusivity, not shopping, buying exclusivity. Mm-hmm. I think what happens is they want a person to go to an ass kicking contest with only one leg. They want Microsoft <laughs> to play a game that Sony's not playing. Sony's not playing the game. People pretend they are Sony's cutthroat. Why should Microsoft not be cutthroat? And there's this weird moralistic thing that happens where they're like, well, we know Sony does this and it sucks, but they just continue to do it. And at some point, your competitors will look at that and say, listen, if you're roided up, I'm going to roid up, right? Like that's Mm -hmm. what everybody did when fucking Armstrong was winning all the cycling championships. They were all roided up. It's just Armstrong was a better roided up dude than the other roided up dudes. (laughs) what's happening now i mean there's no other way to explain it it's like you got to deal with it and the sequel thing i don't know about you maddie skyrim right big deal uh mmo not going away that's another thing people keep forgetting the mmo part i would love to see them blow up even more i think the mmo is awesome so let that be on everything right make that a big place where all these things are um guys a lot of people didn't even like fallout 4 so it's like you know, are you hoping for a Fallout 5? You got Fallout New 77 and it's or 66 and it sucked. So it's like, what are you actually expecting? And Bethesda has already stated it's going to be like seven years. Like, yeah. Who fucking Not knows fair. what would happen in seven years, dude? We're all going to be streaming into our brains. Elon Musk will be talking to us through fucking <laughs> scent machines and shit. A day trip will be to Japan, you know, that type of stuff. <laughs> oh, dude, no, you're, dude, you're the boring company. Like, you'll be able to be like, hey, Carrick, let's do a podcast. You'll get in your fucking laser beam shit and you'll be here. Shoot myself to your house, yeah. <laughs> right. And we'll just be like, so anyway, and, you know, the bar between us right now will be cut in half and it'll be just you and me sitting side by side. Like, yeah, shit's going to change. Hey, that would be amazing. So. I got to be honest, right? If we could just get yeah. together like that for a show. Dude, it's going to happen. And did you see? Oh, by the way, this is a side tangent, but it's about Microsoft. Did you see their Halo, the new VR stuff they showed last week? No, I didn't. Dude, it's called <laughs> Mesh. And it's two people talking to each other, but they're not near each other. It was awesome. And th- this is like Microsoft's what? foray into VR again and stuff. Mm. And yeah, it's called Mesh. It was an hour long and it was like showing people talking to each other. But the crazy shit was it was augmented reality as well. He goes outside and there's like Pokemon style creatures, obviously mm-hmm. not Pokemon, but they were in the real world with him. And if you have AR, you can see it. If somebody has VR, they see the entire world. It's crazy cakes. And it's the first time that. ever, Maddie, a positive VR showing. It was an hour long and the positivity coming out of that show 
was crazy high. And one of it was about podcasts and about meetings yeah. where it would look like you two were sitting next to each other. Like it would, it, so you, you know, cause like I have the weird green screen, halo shit around me. You have different lighting. This would basically allow us to do this together. Like you should check it out or it sounds, it looks like you're checking it out. Yeah. But, I'm just I, like, that just sounds, I'm just making sure it's in my tab, introducing Microsoft mesh. Yeah. You, you got to check this feel out. Like you're in the same place, <laughs> dude, dude, it's redonk. It's re And again, I want to make sure people aren't like, wow. Hey, fucking, it doesn't look perfect. I'm not saying that. I'm saying we, we were talking about five, seven years in the future. Microsoft has stated they have a 10-year plan, which can break. But I have a feeling some of this stuff is in that plan. That's all I was getting to. Dude, yeah. It's exciting to think about, man. I, I mean, I want to see Microsoft get into VR, so fingers crossed on that. And, and I mean, Bethesda loves VR. They were one of the first adopters and of that. And he mentioned it, Maddie. Yeah. Phil Spencer, yeah. very first thing he mentioned was you guys' coverage with VR, and I was like, oh, oh. Mm -hmm. I feel like Xbox has to be working on something with VR. I mean, I they're obviously so. doing that, but I'm saying for gaming specifically, like a, a yeah. gaming VR headset or some type of compatibility. Yeah, uh, that'd be great. Just be like, yeah. it works. Oh, exactly. So <clears throat> I would dig the hell out of that, man. I'd be so excited. I, I, think, I think they're working towards that. I, I get why it's not their number one priority, though. Yeah, it's still yeah, me building too. up. Me too. Anything else we want to add on to uh, what's going on with Xbox and Bethesda? I mean, we got the exclusives covered. The Game Pass games are there. We talked about Phil, Todd, um, their their dialogue. I mean, I feel like we've hit every thing. Uh, I will say Todd emphasized that the importance of being able to work on one thing and not a bunch of things. And I thought that was kind of a subtle way of saying Starfield will be exclusive. That was uh, I did, too. And technology wise. He, yeah, you he they definitely mentioned one technology was easier. So. Yeah, there was a uh, there was a tool I mentioned a couple of episodes ago. I'm going to see if I can pull it up for oh, everybody. Oh, in tech, in tech, in tech was one. That yeah, was they very did much, say yeah. that in tech would be, you know, going forward. Yeah, they are, uh, are, hold on. I got to I got to no, find right. this. Um, where is it? It was a type of uh, A.I that Xbox uses that they introduced a couple of years ago uh, that makes game development much easier for them. And uh, where is it? Here we are. Uh, the ML uh, game core, game core, game core, game core. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. For Xbox game development, uh, bridging the gap between platforms of PC and console. Uh, yeah, this is the one. And there's direct X 12. And so, there's a lot there that I think developers can use on the Xbox side of things. And when you have Xbox familiar with their tool set, that can be really great. So, uh, you know, one thing they didn't mention, Maddie. last thing, Bethesda also has the streaming technology that they showed for the shooter oh, two yeah. years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I noticed that they talked about streaming, but they didn't talk about streaming like any tech or anything. But they did state he did say the tech, including id tech and i was like i wonder if he's separating i don't remember what that was called it was like oblivion or whatever the name was but it was like mm -hmm. something special for streaming uh low latency streaming and it's like who knows you know those guys may know something you know i mean you, you guys would be surprised how like one company will come in and be like oh dude you have packet loss over here or whatever and and it's just the way you were thinking about going along wasn't correct so who knows what improvements that might bring i can't remember the name yeah, dude yeah, it's not, it's a, I keep thinking Gaikai, but that's PlayStation. No, it that's was, PlayStation, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh my on God. Live on Live was uh, their own separate one. Then there was Gaikai. And then there was this one for Bethesda. And it was like, you know, I don't remember. Nova or. Orion. You know, Orion. Or, 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 Orion. 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 Um, that, yeah. that reminds me, do, what do you think of Wolfenstein? So they, if you noticed, he said something about the newest Wolfenstein and said, which was interesting because they weren't really championing it because I know a lot of people disliked it. I had an okay time, but where do you think that leaves Wolfenstein? Like, I wondered how far along that is because I think Wolfenstein will not be exclusive. I don't think timing wise, mm. it makes sense. I think they've been working on it for what, a year and a half or two? Yeah. Like, <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting because... They were also talking about how someone from Tango made a, a an enemy for 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 id for Doom Eternal, uh, and they showed that. And so they were they were discussing the, like I a collaboration. Okay. 
across yeah they were they were talking about the collaboration across studios and so i wonder how quickly they can accelerate things or if they said okay let's drop the playstation version does that somehow like hurt their development timeline or you know feel like what they've if, wasted time what if they fucking fix the fighting in skyrim dude <laughs> oh you're talking about the, dude. the, the vr like no the no oh. i just mean the fighting in sky in elder scrolls has always been janky oh and dude remember oh, fallout that, 4 that's they did get well not to me i just thought of it so i don't know if my brain's slow but I was like, because no, no. uh, this is the first time you said they did something together. The idea of like, imagine Bethesda or Id or whatever, whoever that guy is, is on a plane and he's just flying to fucking, you know, wherever Fallout 5 is being made, wherever Skyrim is mm -hmm. being made. And he's like, listen, bitches, it's my job to make your fighting feel like Dark Messiah <laughs> of Might and Magic, which if anybody or Might and Magic, Dark Messiah, if anybody's played that, that's got amazing first person fighting. Right, dude. Dude, Skyrim yeah, I mean, with good first and or Vermintide style fighting. Sorry, yeah. now I'm getting excited. Well, I mean, now Vermintide. I'm just continue. I apologize. Well, it works because Vermintide, you know, third party exclusive with Fat Shark. So oh, yeah, maybe, maybe. Oh. I, I think that's long overdue. I mean, you could see in Fallout 4 there was a massive improvement to the combat. Is it like Destiny or something? No, but you could tell that it helped. They contacted Machine Games. They? They, they said that before. I think you told me. Yeah, that. and so uh, they just put a bigger spotlight on that. But to answer your question about Wolfenstein and the timing of it, I agree. I've I've wondered that. I think a lot of future games will be exclusive, but you know, I, I mean, think of it this way: they said Starfield was in full development for since Fallout 4's DLC ended. So that's August 2016 was when Nuka World dropped. And they obviously dropped Starfield for a little bit to go full production on Fallout 76, get that out the door, then move back to Starfield. So point being is that was many years before this deal took place. I think that will be more telling because if Starfield is exclusive, they dropped a version that was probably fully developed, right? You have to imagine with all that time spent, you know, and instead they decided let's now go all in on this Xbox version of the game. Um, and the real question is, is that where maybe the reason we have $7.5 billion, we keep asking that because it is a very astronomical price to Bethesda say, well, if we're going to drop Starfield from PlayStation, you're yeah. going to account for yeah. our prediction of copies sold uh, or something along those lines. Uh, that's entirely possible. Uh, so, you know, when it comes to Wolfenstein, I feel like if the president is set by Starfield, which has been in development for a long time, then I don't know if Wolfenstein will end up being exclusive to PlayStation um, or, or exclusive to Xbox. Sorry. It's really tough to call on that. Um, it's just going to be a domino effect. Like I think Starfield will set one precedent. Wolfenstein can set another. If Wolfenstein's okay. exclusive to Xbox, then Doom will probably be exclusive. That type of thing. Can I add one thing that now of I'm course. excited? Now I'm excited because I thought about this a little more. Uh -oh. Fuck. So when two companies work together, there's just thousands of more different things. And they were talking so positively about Game Pass. Imagine that they announced Dishonored 3 chapters or something. And it's like oh, two dude. hours of Dishonored 3 released every three months, which, by the way, Microsoft oh. will hit. If anybody has issues with like chapters of anything, Microsoft has hit everything. Undead, they've made Undead Game Labs Pass. hit with State of Decay. <laughs> Game Pass, but I'm saying they're chapters of stuff. They actually have a set like you will hit March if you say March. You know, there's other than uh, Halo. Okay. But can you imagine <laughs> the we, so, there's some things and they stated in this meeting that Game Pass lets them make games that they would not have probably made. Yeah, Todd because, said that. Yeah. Right. Imagine if they were like, dude, we think Dishonored. By the way, I'm not a big fan of Dishonored, but the reason why I'm excited is because I do feel that that might allow some of these companies prey. What if they say prey didn't sell well, but Microsoft is like prey is a good game. Let's do a sequel. Give you the time. Dude, I feel that's in the cards. Like, I dude. Feel, uh, yeah. And that I feel two things are, are, are exactly. I feel two things are guaranteed in the cards through this acquisition. I think a new fallout game some type of collaborative fallout game i mean not just a bethesda fallout game like i think some some team somewhere uh you know because no one knows what roundhouse is working on they were formerly human head who did prey 2 and then bethesda nabbed them after they did their development on rune 2 uh so who knows what they're working on but they, they could have said like hey on. you could start yep. developing something uh, a lot of people forget, I mentioned Bethesda Game Studios Montreal for 
uh, their mobile initiative, but it you know they have grown Bethesda Game Studios a ton, and the only full release BGS uh, Montreal did was Skyrim Special Edition. Outside of that, it has been mobile games. Maybe they work on a full thing. Uh, so this collaborative effort can really take them a, a long way. But point being is through this deal, I think you're going to see a Prey 2. I've not heard this, by the way. I just think Game Pass brings that security where Prey 2 was an amazing game, but it absolutely did not find its player base. And if it did, it found it pretty late. Where something like Game Pass, there are just certain games that fit well. It's like, that's not the game that a lot of people are going to, boom, 60 bucks. I don't know why, because Arcane makes amazing stuff, but it's a perfect Game Pass game. And you'll see the developers happy because they'll have thousands and thousands of more players than previously. And like I said, of course, I think a new Fallout game of some kind is going to come. There's no doubt in my mind about that, just because there are way too many stars that have aligned for Phil to, to, to be like, nah, well, let's just leave this shit, man. Isn't Fallout one of the biggest whatever? Fallout's whatever's? bigger than Elder Scrolls, I believe. Right. As, as so far to as me, we've seen with selling. Right. To me, I don't see it humanly possible that Microsoft isn't like, hey, you guys have Horizon Zero Dawn. You guys have this. We want to make sure we have a genre, you know, representative from some of these games looking at those more style, but for sure looking at that. I mean, they tried it with Tomb Raider. They bought exclusivity for that first game. So I could absolutely see them. I, I mean, I think you'd be. Fallout 76 is a thing, but it's not the thing and it never will be the thing. So mm -hmm. to me, it makes, I, I mean, my assumption is Bethesda's already been tinkering with it. And then Microsoft most likely is going to, they'll discuss it and they'll be like, what fits, you know? Here's a question so, yeah. for you. Cause now we're kind of going down the rabbit hole. Let's do it. This is where I get interested anyway. <laughs> so these are exciting games to me. Let's say in our hypothetical situation in exile is involved with a new fallout game, right? We know they're working on a triple A RPG on unreal engine five, but I think they're expanding their team more and they will have the capability to do a side project like this. Which conference does that get announced at? Is it Bethesda's or is it Xbox? Do you announce it at Xbox and then show more at Bethesda? Like, how does that, you know, I've wondered no, about that. That's, I, I absolutely feel that. Well, also, Microsoft will bring everybody out anyway. So Microsoft will be like, um, what's his name? I'm sorry, the guy from uh, In Exile. Um, oh, Brian Fargo. Thank you. So Obsidian, uh, uh, Fargus, uh, Fargus? Fergus Urquhart. A, there we go. Fergus Urquhart. He, uh, yeah right close enough mm -hmm, he mm -hmm. he could come out i definitely see them saying these are the games and then at the bethesda show it only makes sense to say let's dive into this so yeah mm -hmm. i mean dude i mean i just i don't think people get it even one ecosystem game pass even what there's there are pluses it's happened so you're gonna have to deal with it i would just say take the pluses out of this which are the things we're trying to talk about well we can talk about the negatives it is it is going to stop some people from being able to experience games down the line. But even right now, maybe a game that goes on multiple systems, there's some stuff there that could be, for example, mods. Dude. Microsoft has already stated they're looking. I don't know if you saw this, but yesterday. Um, oh, man, what is it? Yesterday, there was a game where Microsoft stated that they are now looking at mods for it. It was. Uh, oh, Stalker 2. Stalker 2. Of, yep, by the yep. way, we have Stalker, that if there's a game out there that. Oh, did I hit our news? No, 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 no. I don't care. We can, oh. it's, it was literally going to be a passerby, so go for it. Okay, I was just going to say, if there's a game out there that probably needs a mod to fix some stuff, it's Stalker, because Stalker is yeah. really complex, and there's a lot, and so somebody may be like, hey, I want to make this a little easier for some gamers. Dude, we want more mods. It seems to me Bethesda already was moving that way. Microsoft. That's another thing. I have a question for you. What do you think goes on with Creation Club? How does this get six. merged into Game Pass? Oh, yeah. I think it sticks because of Game Pass, actually. I think it becomes more... Bethesda likes it a lot more because of Game Pass. Because but don't you pay for it? You do pay to, to get the Creation Club content. Gotcha. Um, I guess you pay for EA stuff. It's it's That's the way Microsoft makes, a, I, I think, a lot of their money off of Game Pass because we saw how much Sea of Thieves rolled in after Game Pass because so many people... You know, because we saw so many players and in turn they were spending money on microtransactions. You know, same thing is happening with State Creation of Club. State of the K is another one. Yeah, I mean, having these, and I'm not a fan of it, by the way, just so people know, I I, I would love, I, I, I am conflicted on Creation Club because I am friends with a lot of modders and I understand how much it has helped them, where Bethesda mm. does pay them 
to help them out. And these modders I have followed for years. I've covered their content. They are some of the hardest working people I know when it comes to this stuff. And they have kept the community afloat. So they deserve that pay and they deserve that security. And I would happily let that system exist just for them. But the pricing is not great. So if there was like a Game Pass discount, which we've already seen with like Outer sure, Worlds DLC. Sure, sure. Right. You know, sure, that's fine with me. Um, but I think, yeah, that system will continue to exist through Bethesda okay. Game Studios games, you know, for sure. And I hope to see them expand the modding initiative. I don't know much about oh. the tech side of that, but I would love to see Xbox just say, yeah, instead of it just being limited to this capacity, you, you, can, you can get those brand new locations that people have like made Sky oh. Oblivion. Skywind. I, oh my. That is also very cool. Awesome. But I was even thinking just Bethesda and their expertise with getting mods to work on Microsoft's games, which a lot mm. of companies haven't. Mm. Just saying, if you're in the Microsoft stable and you want some, I mean, what if Creation Club, whether the money goes away, you know, Microsoft certainly has talked. Remember in the original Xbox, Microsoft was talking about Jenny can make her own skin for a th for a skateboard and sell it that Microsoft's already talked about that. So mods aren't too much different. What if they merge it all together and Microsoft states creation club maybe goes in your game pass and now any company can make mods for any games, but it's all creation club or it's like the front they end expand it to, to, to something like uh, what uh, Microsoft Fr flight simulator does. Right. Don't they have like a whole big yeah. storefront kind of, and it's, it's a little more dude kind of like that. Yeah. I, maybe something along those lines. I mean, it would be awesome to go state of decay. Oh, there's a couple mods here and people get paid for them. Right. I, mm -hmm. I want people to get paid for mods. Like I have no issue with that. Um, right. I think that's awesome. So, yeah, uh, that's another really big bonus. We might it might take a while, but I would love to see them, you know, merge and put together because I, I also don't like two prices. I don't like Creation Club being if you're already going to be paying for your Xbox Live and stuff. Hopefully they figure out a way still pay the modders. But, you know, maybe Microsoft's yeah. taking that. All right. With that. Let's move into number two on our news. <laughs> is that only... Sorry, I spit. Is that only number two? Sorry. That was number one. Oh, shut, oh, shut <laughs> now we're on number oh, two. Okay, sorry, we're on number two. <laughs> it's widely known that Xbox and Sega have been talks for some time now. To what extent, most are unaware, but it's clear a relationship is developing if bringing Fantasy Star Online 2 to the West, all of Yakuza being on Game Pass, and having Yakuza Like a Dragon's next-gen update be exclusive to Xbox at its launch, if anything is to go by. By the way, that... Uh, next gen update is now on playstation 5 so go ahead check that game out if you're interested it is very well possible the next step is being put into place which would be taking atlas games over to the xbox consoles atlas the team that helped bring us the likes of persona catherine and 13 sentinels plus much more releases annual surveys to gauge the interest of their player base on various titles they develop and publish while some may not consider it a telling move that while some may not consider it a telling move sorry about that atlas inquired players on their interest for a persona 5 re-release in 2019 before announcing it shortly after so sometimes they're testing the waters they already know what they're doing. They just want to see right. how you feel about it. With that said, the latest survey asks many questions, but the most one relevant to this show is the first time ever edition of Xbox. Atlas asks players if they want to see releases from a number of its core franchises on Xbox One and Xbox Series X slash S. This includes the likes of Persona, Shimigami Tensei, Etrian Odyssey, Dragon's Crown, 13 Sentinels, Odin Sphere, and Raiden Historia, just to name a batch. Now, this is the important part, I think, more than anything mentioned there. Persona 4 Golden was ported from PS Vita to PC June 13th, 2020, surpassing 1.5 million sales and 500K players worldwide. Between PlayStation Vita and PC, the game now combines for over 2 million sales. Atlas expressed gr great pleasure in both the big boom of the game, which brought them revenue and fan attention. Taking a look at PlayStation's recent statements about dormant PS titles on, uh, on, on the system being brought over to PC will give them ed additional revenue. You can imagine that Sega and Atlas are interested in following suit with their own products. And I thought that was really important to mention all those stats because... When you look at how well Persona 4 Golden did on PC, there was a lot of hype behind it. It was a nice shadow drop. People were really excited. I think it was announced and then shadow dropped during the PC gaming show uh, in June. 
And it was a really good port. It didn't really have anything wrong with it. And it was kind of strange seeing uh, Xbox controls. If you had the controller hooked up, you're seeing Xbox controls uh, for a Persona game. And it got me thinking at that time, way before this show and everything happened with Bethesda and we were more in the Xbox space, uh, what if these games came to Xbox? And so I think what Atlas is realizing now is something like Persona 3 is lying dormant. You know, 1, 2 are lying dormant. Uh, and imagine getting Persona 5 over to PC or Xbox. Um, I feel like this is something they're looking at because Persona in specific, specifically is on the cusp of becoming very, very, very popular. In our sphere, gaming sphere, it's well known thanks to really 4 and 5. Um, that's no disrespect yeah, to 3. Sure. Well, love 3, but you know, 4 and 5 are really what brought it. A ton of popularity. And I think they're trying to get that big boost, right? We just saw them make an action Persona game, which we've never seen before. I think there's a reason behind that outside of, hey, this would be cool. Um, and it gives you a different feel and control for the characters in the universe. Um, but it gives them additional exposure. I mean, I've, I've, I've beat the drum here on this show about Persona to Game Pass for a while because I have a very strong feeling it is going to happen. I've been told that Phil has visited uh, Sega on multiple occasions. Um, so something's happening there. Um, I'm not saying it's an acquisition, but something's happening in the sense that probably they're looking at some type of, uh, we'll just say Game Pass additions. Um, so what do you make of this, right? With this survey there um, and the core franchises that Atlas owns, um, you know, mind you, this is Atlas, not Sega, but Sega owns Atlas. Um, but what do you make of, of this kind of exciting development here? What so do you know was was my was was Phil visiting Sega or Atlas? Well, he was visiting Sega, but Sega owns Atlas. Right, but I'm just saying he was he was visiting Sega at Sega's like headquarters. Correct. I guess Correct. yeah, okay. Sega. Yeah, he was visiting um, Sega. Yeah, that's what I was like, told. Like I feel that that's more of an indicator that it would be a full on thing, um, because most likely he would go to. See, I guess that's, that is, a, like, how do you, because here's the thing, funny enough, in this, la, in this event today, they stated that those guys had gone to all the different developers' mm -hmm. locations. So it's like, how much would Phil go to, you know, we don't know Phil, and I don't want to get too in-depth, but it's like, how much would he go, you know, directly to these guys and see their stuff at, like, Atlas headquarters? Um, I would say, overall, I don't know as much as you do about, like, its popularity, but I don't think somebody do a survey for absolutely no I no reason. And they mm -hmm. most likely would do a survey after, as in they've already started development, you know. And it could have been something where maybe they wanted to see after, like maybe they were doing development and they were like, let's check in and verify everybody still wants this. But I, I it's a weird to do a survey because it's like, would anybody say no? I mean, I guess it's possible that somebody would say no we now. don't want to see a game on a system but it see that always seems weird i to had me. to imagine so. sega is seeing in general that for example yakuza has become insanely popular and that and was microsoft when it, paid to have it you know yeah exactly it's a big deal it's a big deal exactly and i think getting it on xbox was a big part of its mm -hmm. uh its its booming success because it was all in game pass you could try it out uh, and it was all there in general, which was really important to note because this was originally a PlayStation exclusive game, um, which is fine. It was a great get for PlayStation. But I think Xbox's goal when it comes to Sega is really, I don't know if they could ever buy them and acquire them. Entire, they certainly have the money, but I'm saying I don't know if they would be actually able to do that. Um, but if they, they did, that would be insane. I think their goal is to make sure that moving into the future, the next Persona game is on Xbox day one as well. I would agree. Yeah, I would yeah. agree. That seems that get, seems get the to be at minimum in the past on. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and verify your watcher and and your game pass is a good place to put it because they've stated people go and watch the game pass to, and mm -hmm. play those games. So yeah, I mean, test it out on Game Pass. Look at it. Maybe that's why the survey. Maybe this. Maybe people had good response to it, and so they were like, okay, we've had good response to this. Let's do a survey and see. Um, but I would agree. I don't think Microsoft would not want those. I mean, it only makes sense. It was their exclusive, by the way, for the Xbox. Like, the, that update was theirs. That's pretty crazy when you think about mm -hmm. it. Like, that it was just for Xbox Series, so. Yeah, I um, it's it's funny, because Sega actually praised Game Pass uh, a couple of weeks ago. I saw on that. On this show. Yeah. And, um, yeah, they said they're really happy oh, yeah, with it, and that two-point hospital 
had pushed over three million players worldwide. Um, so I I have to imagine with uh, you seeing Bethesda, th this pulls us back into the Bethesda conversation. One of the key things that Sarah had said was, and I thought this was very telling, was Bethesda joining up with Xbox brings confidence to their other partners. So I yeah. feel like they were talking to someone else. Bethesda committed first, and now Bethesda showing how happy they are, which yeah, I don't you know, like. They don't have a gun to their heads, and that will likely lead to the dominoes, dominoes falling for another company at some point down the line. So we'll keep our eye on Sega and Atlas, but um, I is Bethesda I've put I have it out there for a while. No, go for it. Is Bethesda still publishing some of their own games? Um, yeah, I actually don't know about that. I have a question. Would it be too crazy to see Atlas games published by Bethesda for Xbox? I guess it would, because Sega's the... No, Sega owns them. Sega's the publisher. But Atlas goes through Bandai Namco for publishing sometimes. Do they not? Or am I wrong on that? Is it Sorry, all, I was they... actually... I'm not trying to be rude. I was actually reading... Uh, Pete Hines says Bethesda will still publish its own games. Uh, this was... September 21st, 2020. So, is it possible that I don't know if it's Bethesda, exclusive, that will change. Sorry. What if Bethesda also published other people's games? And so, mm. it's not always Microsoft, but it might be, like, what if... Because, does... Man, am I, I wrong? Know. Does Atlas sometimes get published by Namco? Or is it always Sega? Do they always go through Sega for the publishing of, of, oh. of Atlas games? I guess it depends on the IP. I'm trying. Is there a specific game you're thinking of right now? Because I feel like I've always seen Sega. Okay, if you've always seen Sega, then this could not happen. What I was thinking was, at times, it may not be a little bit like how, like, uh, We Happy Few, you know, that were where there was like, you know, differences mm -hmm. and stuff like. And I was just sitting here thinking, what if they also meant along the lines of Bethesda taking on publishing? Because I, if if Bethesda is going to publish their own games, that could also mean they could publish other games. Microsoft may not want to publish a game and. Bethesda may say here the confidence is that like we're here to publish games too because Bethesda mm -hmm. does have a lot of smaller not smaller studios but you get my drift they're not they have a couple of the ones that mobile and stuff like that well so. yeah maybe globally speaking because there were times I'm trying to think in my head I, I can see box arts where you're like wait why is this company on this box art here that, because right. they published it in a different region of the world yep. like I've seen ones with Bethesda For sure happened I want to say Ubisoft or something like that um there's one there's one of those in particular that really stands out um or it was like 2k in someone uh, i think it was 2k in bethesda i think that was for mm. oblivion maybe that's what comes to mind right now um so yeah there's definitely that to be considered for those who don't know i view sega in a way kind of like bethesda with their structure where you have sega at the top kind of like Zenimax, then you have atlas underneath which is sort of like bethesda and then you have something like vanillaware who goes through Sega all the time. So when they released 13 Sentinels or Dragon's Crown, it was published by Atlas. Um, or you have the, the P-Studio, which does Persona, which goes through Atlas. So it's this interesting kind of like branching effect or, or Sonic Team, which goes through Sega. Um, so they yeah. are structured in a, a pretty similar way. But fingers crossed. I'm, I actually want to see Xbox players get their hands on Persona. I don't think it'll be on an exclusive capacity, so keep your expectations in check. But do know Phil is making the rounds. That much I can say. Number three. The Outer Worlds second and final DLC has been revealed. It goes by the title of Murder on Eridanos. Uh, this was actually confirmed a while ago. But today, uh, Thursday, that was revealed. Uh, it, it covers a Aether Wave drama. Uh, taking you to a brand new planet in the game. Um, where you're investigating a murder mystery of Halcyon Helen. And actually... I got to play the a decent amount of this. Um, I, I've played a couple of hours of it. Um, for those who don't know, I'm a big Outer Worlds fan. Uh, I've had access to this DLC for a while, but just these last couple of days, I got around to playing some of it for this show and a, a video I'll be producing on my channel at some point. Um, did you actually, did you get access to this DLC or, or take time to play? I didn't it? even know the game was even coming out. Yeah. I don't blame you because honestly, at the end of the day, I was very disappointed with like the, the time they decided to announce this was the same day that everyone's going to be talking about Xbox and Bethesda. So I and thought I don't that even was know when it comes out. Do you? When does I think the seventeenth? Yeah, it comes out the seventeenth. Um, I'll double oh, check this that. Month? Oh, yeah. I should email yeah. them and, yeah. and ask. Anyway, yeah, yeah, it, sorry. Uh, it, 
I'll double check real quick for our audience. I forgot to write that down. Launches next week. This is on the PlayStation blog here. Uh, March 17th. Correct. Okay. Uh, so yeah, this is a, a new expansion. Uh, I, I can only talk about the first hour, so I'll just give some of my impressions on it. Um, one of the things that I think is aged poorly with the Outer Worlds has been um, really it's humor and it's universe. The reason I put it that way is I like it, but a lot of people don't because eventually kind of like a South Park stick of truth, going back to that humor gets stale and you want to get to the certain parts that uh, that are, are a little more, I guess, dry. Um, which I totally understand. What's interesting about this DLC is instead of everyone trying to sell you a product or talking through a company, you get that for like a split second and then they quickly humanize. And I found that really nice uh, because it definitely will be refreshing for players coming back in who are interested. By the way, if you're a Game Pass owner, this is 10% off this, this expansion. Um, but overall, the story has me curious. I'm not like super grabbed by it. Um, but it has me curious to find out who committed this murder. Like I said, there was a a, a television star who was connected to Rizzo's, uh, which is a, I believe it's a drink manufacturer in uh, the Outer Worlds universe. And um, she dies out of nowhere and you're investigating and there's multiple deaths involved in this uh, expansion and, and you're pretty much playing the role of an inspector, which is really nice. And it's kind of funny because Peril and Gorgon function in a similar way. For those who don't know, that was the first uh, DLC for the Outer Worlds. Um, you have this thing called the discrepancy amplifier. So it's a gun that you'll take out and it'll give you updates when you're near evidence. Uh, and you'll take it out and you'll scan the evidence and you'll go through a conversation like kind of using skill checks to, to identify things with the dirt, uh, for example, and see like what exactly is going on here or inspect a body or inspect a chemical or a drug. Uh, so it's actually very cool in that way. Uh, it's very much just playing the role of a of a detective, and I enjoyed that a lot. Uh, what's my biggest issue is actually there is uh, it's a lot more expansive and flat, by the way, compared to Parallel and Gorgon. So Parallel and Gorgon was an asteroid, so it very yeah. much reminded you it was an asteroid. So like you can you would die on certain drops if you if you fell too far off uh, a cliff, for example. Um, and so it made navigating like going around big bends and, and, and taking detours to get to certain places. And it was kind of frustrating. Uh, this doesn't gotcha. have that, but the, the trade-off is it's very strange where you have this central hotel. This is where the murder happened. This big hotel. Think of the 10 penny towner tower right in the middle of this planet. Then to the right is a huge bridge that brings you to this orchard field. And this, this orchard has tons of marauders and it doesn't make sense how there was this facility functioning for Rizzo's in between that and this expensive luxurious hotel um, is a bunch of marauders. Uh, it's for the sake of gameplay, but it definitely disconnected me a little bit. Uh, but overall, the the enemy design was a little bit better. One of my complaints with Peril and Gorgon was, was that the combat sucked. The AI still does suck. Um, and so... I got to say, uh, I've been enjoying it. Is it something you got to leap in and play right now? Probably not, but I think it is really good for those of you who are looking for more of the Outer Worlds. Um, I still have to develop my thoughts on it. I have some notes written down, but uh, overall, after a couple of hours of playing, I, I do dig it quite a bit. Um, At least better you than you Gorgon, you're saying? Yes, definitely better than Gorgon. Uh, Gorgon, I, I liked. I thought it was more of a good thing, but it definitely was safe. Uh, they do take some of the, the um, audio logs and they bring them into uh, this DLC. So not only are you having conversations, but you're learning more through these audio logs, which is something that the entire base game of the Outer Worlds did not have. Uh, so that is significant and worth mentioning. But otherwise, yeah, more dialogue, more skill checks, more endings, more side content, uh, a little more expansive, and I think better designed in a lot of ways than Peril and Gorgon already. Um, so I'm very excited to, to finish this one up. Um, so I, I like it and, uh, that's all I can add. Is there anything that, uh, I don't want to say you can add cause you haven't played it, but yeah, no, I just, I, I actually just emailed them. I, th it looks like I did get pinged on it. I guess somehow I missed that one too, but I, um, regardless, like I'm interested in it. You know, Gorgon is like one of those, it's a DLC that maybe I didn't fall in love with, but I do still like the original game. So, I mean, I'll, I'll explore this no matter what. You know, even if even yeah. if it's considered terrible, I'll, I'll probably still check it out because I, I did. I mean, I just really did like that game overall. Like it's just it was, it's just enjoyable. It's not huge. It's not amazing. It was just a good, solid game. 
Yeah. So there's more of that if people are interested. And once again, there's a discount through Game Pass. You can get the game on Game Pass, so you would just only have to pay for the DLC. And if you're looking to dive back mm, in, just that. note that you have to be around level 30 and you cannot do it if your save file is complete. It's a before the game ends type of thing. So I hate that shit. Sorry. Screw yeah, like sucks that. for sure. Sucks. I had that issue with Gorgon, I think, because they gave me the Gorgon wrong... Had that too. They gave me the wrong... Um, game version and so mm -hmm. i ended up having to fucking play a bunch to get to the point to yep. where i could play it and that yep. that's not the best way they they provide a save file if you but i guess they didn't mention that to you because like i i that's what i, said I haven't even them. looked I, at the email i just saw it I, like i literally oh. haven't turned this game on i didn't even know it was coming out i just oh I no i meant for peril when when I got Peril and Gorgon, oh, I no i did yeah. i did as well but it was this is gonna sound weird it was a character i didn't like maddie it was, uh, uh, it, I uh. did use a save game and I loaded it and it was like some girl with k k skills I didn't, you know, like guns and weapons mm -hmm, I didn't mm -hmm. like. And so I played it. Yeah, you want to play your way. Yeah. All right. Number Good four. Stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. It's a great game. I, I, I think it gets a little too much shit nowadays, but we'll talk about that down the line when it comes up. Number four, mods to Stalker 2. It is possible, quote, mods are extremely important to the Stalker franchise, so our case can be considered quite unique, end quote, Bokarev told Kotaku when reached for clarification via an email about this very subject, quote, to a certain extent, we have chosen Unreal Engine for Stalker 2 because of its mod support, end quote. GSC Game World, the developer of, uh, of Stalker 2, Bokarov continued, is committed to making mod support a priority to Stalker 2 on PC and hope to implement that functionality as soon as possible. But Xbox is a whole other story. Quote, the Xbox ecosystem is completely different, end quote, Bokarov added in the email to Kotaku. Quote, there have been cases of official mod support in the Xbox family. They're talking about, of course, Bethesda Game Studios and as well as Microsoft Flight Simulator. And Microsoft was extremely supportive with all of our ideas so far. We're thoroughly investigating what we can do at the moment, and there's probably a way for our ideas to become a reality. However, this shouldn't be considered an official announcement as the development process is a long way off trying and optimizing until release end quote so they're looking into mod support for xbox and i think this yeah. is a good sign of things to come for future games very happy to see that more user created yeah. content the better and that game needs it mm -hmm. from what i've heard i've actually never played stalker i've heard good things. they're though. just really complex they're like they've got a lot of systems going on i think those are the ones that are notorious for having issues so if we can get uh you know a mod on there i'd be happy yeah. Other than that, not much for me to personally add unless you, you got more to say. Mm -mm. Yeah. Slow week otherwise outside of Bethesda for those who don't know, which understandably so Microsoft kind of shut the doors on everything and so that you would only focus on this. Uh, last in our uh, news section here is new Xbox Series X updates. So you have, and as well as the S, sorry. So there is enhancements added to Overwatch. Uh, they added a preferred uh, mode graphics option, which allows switching between three different presets, resolution, balanced, and frame rate. These modes adjust video settings to bias towards image quality, resolution, and frame rate. Resolution. This mode prefers higher resolution output at the cost of some image quality. So the Series X is at 4K 60 hertz, while the Series S is at 1440p 60 hertz. Balanced. This mode prefers image quality at the cost of resolution. The Series X is at 1440p 60 hertz, and then you have Series S at 1080p 60 hertz. Lastly, frame rate. This mode pardon me, prefers higher frame rate at 120 frames per second at the cost of both image quality and resolution with Series X at 1440p, 120 hertz, and Series S at 1080p, 120 hertz. Note, you must have a TV that supports 120 hertz or variable refresh rate to take full advantage of frame rate mode. So Overwatch is getting updated. We don't know the extent of this one, but it was leaked on, a late, on the latest Xbox Wire post that Batman Arkham Knight is getting next-gen upgrades because you could see the Xbox Series and uh, X and S logos on uh, the Batman Arkham Knight logo. So that is coming at some point in time, and that's already on Game Pass. So that's very exciting to see. Uh, while I had some issues with Arkham Knight, that is a game I would not mind returning to, and it was a damn good-looking one. So can't wait to check more of that out. But you know, anything you want to tap in on with uh, these next-gen updates? No, other than you know they screwed up which is sort of sad like they accident yeah. it sounds like they accidentally updated the thumbnail or whatever 
Um, but no, it's really cool to see them. I hope we continue to get more of these updates. Like, it's definitely awesome to see more frame rate for just more frame rate, you know? It just works, which is yeah. to steal a Todd Howardism. Yeah. All right, that's all for our news. Let's get into Game Pass Pick of the Week. So Austin DeBose wrote in for the Game Pass Pick of the Week saying, Hey, Duke's Mayo, I don't believe you guys have brought this up yet on the show, but have you noticed that Game Pass lately provides even more value by offering media outside of just games? This month, for example, with Game Pass, the first season of Dragon Ball Super and One Piece is completely free to claim and own. The sheer value Microsoft provides through Game Pass is downright staggering. Thanks, and keep up the great work. Yeah, this was awesome. Uh, I'm a big fan of both mm. these shows, so uh, give them a look if you have yet to, but just wanted to point that out. That's, uh, we also saw Disney Plus kind of get rolled into Game Pass a little bit, um, so just go ahead and, and keep that in mind so that you can get all the value out of your subscription service. Um, but this, this week, I picked a game that I have a lot of love for, um, yours is empty because I know we got the doc to you late. So I don't know if you even have answers in mind for either section. Nope, but keep looking. I'm, I'm right now. I'm going through it. Okay. Uh, so for me, I picked Dishonored 2. I wanted to keep this on a Bethesda theme for this episode, given our major news. Uh, Dishonored 2, uh, I thought was the best stealth game since Dishonored 1. Uh, I have a lot of love for Arcane. I think they are the most talented studio underneath. Bethesda at this moment in time. I think Bethesda Game Studios wavered where they originally held that crown, in my opinion. Right. Um, but the the level design in Dishonored 2 is so hard to match. And it's really that if you haven't played this yet, now's the time. Um, because number one, Game Pass. Number two, multiple protagonists. So you can play as Corvo or oh, I am forgetting her name. I can't remember her name. Emily? Yeah. No. They is even Emily? announced they even talked about it in this meeting. In this yeah, event. it's it's escaping yeah, I me. I was like, I thought I had I thought I had the knowledge there. Uh, anyway, there's two protagonists to pick between, and they play completely different. So Corvo plays a lot like the one that you experienced in Dishonored One, uh, classic Dishonored gameplay. Uh, well, I want to say her name is Emily. She plays entirely different. So they have their own skill sets, approaches to combat, approaches to stealth, uh, approaches to how the level is designed. Where certain things that maybe Corvo could access, the other character could not. So really highly replayable game. Really fun to go through. Uh, I, I cannot suggest it enough. Some of the mission design and its complexity is mind-bending how uh, they accomplished it. Uh, there's just a lot to love here. And I feel like Dishonored 2, much like Prey, was one of those games that sort of fell to the wayside. Something with arcane games since Dishonored 1. Uh, they just have not really roared. And I don't know why, because I feel like they've only got better. I know Dishonored 2 had a lot of performance issues on PC. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident that stuff is fixed at this point in time from what I've read online, reviews, re-reviews, uh, just general mm -hmm. chatter. A lot of people seem better uh, with how they feel about the game. Uh, so highly recommend, if you have yet to, Give Dishonored 2 a look. I know that for Game Pass Pick of the Week, I personally like to make sure I have a game there that maybe you haven't given a shot. Uh, but with something like this, I feel like given its sales, this is the time is now to, to look at Dishonored 2. Uh, but also, if you're new to the franchise, then Dishonored 1 would, would also slot in here. I, I arguably, I have more nostalgia for Dishonored 1 because uh, it's a little more simple, right? There are a couple more load screens because of that where 2 is a lot more broad and open. Uh, but still, the level of freedom and exploration and creativity in both these games is staggering. Uh, it's overwhelming at times, uh, but just it feels so good to be in these worlds. And um, because they're all open hubs instead of an open world, um, there's a lot of collectibles that, that'll help you in your progression systems uh, that are located throughout the environment. Um, finding environmental details like safe information and, and, and finding like a, a safe in an apartment uh, it reminds me a little bit of like Deus Ex or something like that. So really, yeah, really great series like of games. Deus Ex. And uh, yeah, can't recommend that one enough. So that's my Game Pass pick of the week. Mine is Surge 2. Oh, so I didn't yeah. even I didn't even realize Surge 2 was on Game Pass. It's just one more that I was like, what? But sir, I honestly think Surge 2 is one of the better Dark Souls, Bloodborne style games out there. But I also like Futuristic a little bit more than maybe some other people. But that one's like post-apocalyptic, futuristic. It's got a shit ton of weapons. And other than Neo, I feel like that might have, this one might have like the best weapon variety and feel of, of any of these games. Again, I haven't played Bloodborne. So, um, well, I mean, I haven't like played it and reviewed it, but I played it a little bit. 
So Neo would be my high point, but I would say Surge 2 in particular is probably next in line. I love the yeah. combat in Surge 2. There's a couple difficulty bumps, admittedly. There's some statue bastard uh, in a park. <laughs> the park area in the center was a little rough. Um, but you're right. always doing, like, the wicker work that goes on. There's there's that shortcut shit where it's like, you, you unlock a shortcut and you're like, seriously, dude, why would nobody have had this shortcut unlocked? Like, it makes no <laughs> sense. It makes less sense like a Dark Souls or a Neo. Well, Neo's pretty bad. But uh, it's <laughs> so fun. It's so fun, the different weapons, the upgrades, the way you move around and you're this augmented right. person and you can chop people's arms off to grab their parts, take them home and fucking build more better parts for yourself. And there's few games in the world where like you get to just collect your enemies and take them home. And that game, yeah. allows you, it's, <laughs> it's weird. It's like, I'm going to take your arm off and then I'm going to upgrade my own shit with it, which is it's so it, satisfying. It's, it's satisfying. It's any heavy combat, by the way. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. if you got the fucking arm blades. I can't remember their name or the big ass. There's this massive staff spear you can get in that game. You, oh, everybody, yeah. There's different enemies, the shield, electro shield enemies. Then you can get a drone, which can help you, mm -hmm. which is awesome, by the way, because if that's your style of gameplay, that drone can be upgraded and do crazy shit on its own. It's it, it, it's free. Just go get the fucking game. Yeah. Like, I, I think that one's it. massively overlooked. I'm shocked that's on Game Pass. I didn't even know. I'm shocked that. it's on Game Pass too. I it was like I hit. I just was like, I'm gonna start hitting odd pages, see if I find something cool. And I saw Surge, and just everything else went off my list. I was like, dude, yeah. that just makes no sense to not yep. say that game. It's awesome. Yeah, so definitely go check both those games out. Especially, I will say, Surge Two. Surge Two did not get. I thought it really yeah, improved it from the first one. Love, the first it. one had a lot of potential. Two really just. That you could tell, like, okay, we know what we're doing now. Location and, was better, Maddie. Yeah. Like, everything about that game was better. And I will say, difficulty-wise, a little bit more manageable. I had some issues with some of the bosses. It felt a little clunky oh. at that point. But uh, you're talking about, you know, the, 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 I think the, I do. the first one, the, the, the sp spider. scorpion, I think. Or scorpion or spider, yeah. Dude, I'm pretty sure Holy you and fuck, I may yeah. have even... I can't remember if you and I talked about it during the review or after, but I remember some people who were viewing it going like, dude, seriously, this dude is like, mm. he's rough. And there was a run to him, wasn't there also? Or did, you, yes, was it? Yes. Yeah, oh, that fuck. was yes. not fun. Yeah. Not fun. <laughs> I'm sure we've so. sold them now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You wanna, but you wanna it's, suffer? <laughs> yeah, it's, I, you know how it is. It's like, once you know a little bit, you can prepare. And that is a huge right. reason why I like doing reviews is because I can say there is a bump here. You're not the only one who's experienced mm -hmm. that bump. <laughs> we did. Yeah. Yeah. So keep that in mind. Next is backwards compatible pick of the week. Carrick, I picked Fallout 3. Probably a game most of you have played, but this is one I want to put back on your radar because Microsoft and Xbox did tease FPS boost for these games. Yeah. I recently went back and streamed Fallout 3. Uh, it did not feel great at 30 FPS. I got to be honest. I've been playing these Bethesda Game Studios games on PC for a while. So this is one. Be on the lookout if you've been a console player for most of your time and you have not experienced Fallout in a glorious 60 FPS. It looks like at some point in time it's on the way alongside Oblivion and Morrowind and all that stuff. Uh, which is really, really exciting. But as a whole, Fallout 3 is my personal favorite Fallout. Uh, is it as choice riddled as, say, New Vegas? No, it is not. But I will say, I think memory-wise, nostalgia, uh, the the quest it delivers, the big moments it delivers from yeah. Megaton to to uh, to Arafu and, and just the little things in between, Fallout 3 had such a memorable world and its pacing for, for exploration is really hard to match. Uh, it felt like at every turn, there was something that not only made sense for a post-apocalyptic universe, but it was intriguing. You know, it was like, this is fucking weird. Why are there like vampires here? Well, it's Fallout, but this kind of makes sense why they're behaving this way or or encountering a, a family of cannibals. Uh, whether you've never played before or you want to go back, Fallout 3 is, to me, timeless. I always love going back to this game. The soundtrack, the story... Uh, is all right. You know, it's not that great, but it's it's a classic in my eyes. Um, but the open world and the side quests that are there, uh, there is literally a side quest where you steal the Declaration of Independence, and that is fucking awesome. So if you have not played Fallout 3, keep an eye out for the FPS boost, but even if you want to hop in now, well worth it. Well worth the return. 
uh, the, the, the intro of that game is one of the best of all time. You know, the, the Vault 101 with the GOAT and the time lapses. It's just, oh man, I, I love this game to death. One of my favorites of all time. Uh, a pretty obvious suggestion. I imagine a lot of you have played it. But uh, the other thing is, this is not like uh, Fallout 4 or even Skyrim to some extent where there's a lot of procedural generated content. Uh, this has really none of that. So this game will not run up your play clock an extraordinary amount compared to other open world titles. You will still be here for a while, but it will not be the 90s, hundreds of hours that you would normally spend or be expected to spend in an open world. It's more along the lines of, you can complete, complete all the content in like 30, 40 hours. It's pretty manageable. Uh, that's not including DLC, which some is good, some is not that great. But Fallout 3 is my back and pat pick of the week. Game of the Year edition, by the way. Uh, well, yeah, right, because that'll yeah. include all the DLC, won't yeah. it? Yeah, all the born. DLC. Yeah, so for me, uh, I do want to say with Fallout especially, so I think Fallout 3 is better than Fallout New Vegas. Let me just Let me just say exactly why. Because I feel that Fallout 3 is a little janky and didn't right. streamline stuff to just be the story that you saw in Fallout New Vegas, which arguably people like better. I actually think Fallout 3 was like, hey, let's try some stuff. This is the first Fallout that's going to be first person. And some things, there's some bumps in the road. And for whatever reason, that's why my memory also sticks with 3. Is the bump, like, there were just, there was moments where you weren't always hightailing it to another quest. Sometimes in Fallout 3, what's the first place you go to, um... Megaton, right? Yes. Yes. So you Megaton's pretty easy to go to if you want to follow that quest. But like I did with that one, I just turned left and started walking. And there's there's just quests in weird areas. And this might be because it's not procedural generated. But mm-hmm. there's things that just capture my attention in that game more so. So yeah, I would I would definitely agree with that. My answer though is one that I was gonna be honest, I did not know was backwards compat. I've got the original, I've got the 360, and that's where I played it, but this is going to sound weird, but Dead Rising 2, and it's not Dead Rising 2 the normal, it's Dead Rising 2, uh, which is the one with, uh, it's called Code West, it's the one with Frank West replacing the Dead uh, the Dead oh. Rising 2 main guy. I didn't hate the Dead Rising 2 main guy, I was just blown away that they were like, let's make the game pretty much again, but we'll put Frank in because people mm-hmm. like him. And those are on backwards compat, and I I really love Dead Rising. Dead Rising has a ton of gameplay, man. It's just it, like the amount of weird shit you can do and mixing cool weapons. So yeah, that would definitely be my uh, like backwards compat yeah, game. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't you, even I used aware to have a lot it's backwards of trouble compat. with Dead Rising. What'd you say? I used to have a lot of trouble with Dead Rising too. I remember when I first played it. Like my friends used to make fun of me because I I sucked at the game. I died a ton. And yeah, I, I haven't yeah. gone back since. I got to the roller skating boss fight, which that game has awesome boss fights, by the way. But I got to that and just, that was it for me. I, I can't do this. Dude, Dead Rising's a weird... Okay, let's do it. The Dark Souls of zombie games. But it is. They're, <laughs> like, it is not to be rude. I'm just thinking about it and I'm thinking about how you could die mm-hmm. in the time limits, even though two and three, you know, adjusted the way those were done. But you could die on a boss and be like, why did I die? Or, or not why did I die, but the guy moved like he had a chimney up his ass. Like, he, there was not a lot of good animation, you know? So, like, yeah, they, they were, and there was a lot of weight to Frank. Like, you'd try to stop him, and Frank would be like, rr, rr, rr. you know, and there was the mm-hmm. fatigue systems and all that. So, anyway, Dead Rising is an awesome uh, series, and I don't know if 3, no, 4 is out on uh, Game Pass, but if it is, you should also check out 4, despite what everybody says. I liked 4 fuck everybody else even though that's not a backwards compact game i'm saying check that one out as well yeah fuck everyone else why not yeah all right now we move on to pc deals of the week so i put a little note here that uh, hardware has been hard to find as i'm looking to build my own pc uh just know that some weeks will be scattered on the hardware side of the deal so if it just looks like oh it's just game deals maddie please spare me Please don't say it. <laughs> I'm, I am well aware we're going to be doing a lot of game deals in the uh, the coming weeks just because it's getting harder to find hardware uh, because these sales will sometimes pop up. They will exist, uh, but by the time that you can actually get them uh, for the main show when it goes live to everybody, that sale may not be available. So I try to be conscious of what uh, people can go and actually buy when it goes to everybody. So you'll see quick deals or quick available availability of stock, but 
Not enough time for us to get this show out. So number one is the Intel i9, 9,900K Coffee Lake, 3.6 gigahertz, eight core box processor. This is that micro center. You can check it out for 250 buckaroos. Not too bad. Uh, for a little bit more than 250 bucks, you can get at Best Buy the WD Easy Store 16 terabyte external USB hard drive. So this actually factors out to 16 bucks per terabyte. Uh, really good if you just need a absolute metric ton of storage space and need to carry it around a lot, uh, especially for your games. This could be something that's very useful to have down the line. Now on for games itself, uh, Steam has The Outer Worlds on sale for 50% off, so you can get it for 30 bucks. Uh, I know some of you out there are Game Pass subscribers, so keep in mind that if you have Game Pass, don't buy this, but if you are not a Game Pass subscriber and you are just on PC, you want to own The Outer Worlds, this is a pretty good deal. Some people call it a false deal because it's on $30 quite often, uh, but I still think the game is worth 30 bucks, so I wanted to throw it in there. The Ubisoft Store has some really good deals on some awesome fucking games. Uh, start South Park, The Sick of Truth, as well as Fractured Butthole, Ooh are both 90% off. Stick of Truth is three bucks. Three bucks. And Fractured Butthole is five. They're These are must buys. amazing games. Definitely buy mm -hmm. those. Even the second one, which is a, a tiny bit of a step down, maybe compared, depending on who you are and what you like. Still great games. Yeah, I agree. These are these are games you got to play. Uh, Stick of Truth, yeah, is a, is a better RPG. Fractured Butthole is still pretty good. Still, yeah, still yeah. good, and and there's a there's a scene in that game in a in a club, which pays for itself. It's so funny. You will get a kick out of both these games, and there's a Each boss game fight. Has, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Each yeah. game has a <laughs> boss fight that's like questionable, you know. Which yeah, is you're like, like, how did this get in? How did this happen? right? Like, dude, how did they get away with? Like, obviously, whoever published that knew what was going on. But damn, son, there's some shit that's said and done in those games that is just absolutely next level. Yeah. And hey, you mentioned the search too. Uh, it's funny because it's here in our deals. Uh, you can get on Newegg an online game code for the search too for 10 bucks. So if you want to own it instead of uh, getting it through Game Pass, that's always there. Just know Game Pass will always intercept these deals. But for those of you who want to actually own the product and go back to it whenever they feel like and not worry about the, the cycle, that's what Game Pass is about, right? Try it out, buy it in full. Like Blockbuster. All right, five ending questions. Ray Ripley is our first write in. I don't know what the hell this intro is. Never do it again. Hey, titty gobblers. I have a hypothetical for you guys. How would the industry have looked if Microsoft had bought Nintendo in the late 90s slash early 2000s? How well do you think Microsoft would have handled Nintendo and its IPs? Have a mediocre day. I don't know. We're running on a big hypothetical here, right? Like, what if they bought the biggest game company on the planet yeah exactly i mean i guess we might have seen a portable from them earlier from from microsoft i would i could definitely see like a microsoft like switch version and it might be a little bit better hardware wise but that's it's about the only thing i can think off the top of my yeah, head yeah that's funny you mentioned see. that that was like my first answer you know would smash bros exist under microsoft you gotta wonder <laughs> yeah you gotta wonder if that would have yeah, if that would have been a thing at all, or yeah, I mean that that is a big hypothetical. Like mm -hmm. it, it's so long ago too. Yeah, so they were a completely different beast. Like we're thinking of Phil Spencer now, but exactly, what, what was he like a exactly. teenager back then? That like, was yeah. his teenager. That would have been prior to Shane Kim, which would have been I can't even remember who was prior to Shane Kim. So yeah, yeah, you're talking ages, generations. So. Can't answer much on it, but I still wanted to Sorry. pick it because I thought it was a good question nonetheless. Um, and honestly, I just think that the industry would be in a much different place. People in the comments can answer what they think uh, if they've got mm -hmm. more time to look it up and think about it. But yeah, that's that's a... We do see some of the audience do that, so... Yeah, yeah. that's a deep question. Sean Mason is our next right in. Hey, boys, although I have never played a Halo game, I'm fascinated with Halo Infinite. However... Outside of the Halo community, there doesn't seem to be a lot of conversation about Microsoft's biggest franchise. With the extra year of development time, free-to-play multiplayer, bringing on Halo veteran Joe Staten, and, oh, sorry, to lead the campaign, and the focus on bigger campaign play spaces plus side content, I think Infinite could be something special and surprise people. What does Halo Infinite need to do to be in the Game of the Year conversation? Best Sean M. P.S. 
One of my seventh grade students just discovered KOTOR and he is in love with it. Let's go. Let's go. Oh, cool. Give that student an A. All right. <laughs> uh, I, I don't... <laughs> And some people are going to be like, why'd you pick this question? I don't like the question, what does this game need to do to be in a game of the year conversation? Because I feel like that's better retroactively because you could obviously say for any game before launch, have a good story, have great gameplay, have a loop, you know, have this, this, that. I feel like it's better to look at it afterwards. Why did this end up in the game of the year conversation or what did it miss to to not be in that? Uh, So ignoring that, I wanted to focus on, I think what is a important question, which is the conversation around... Halo, um, do you think there is enough at this point in time? Um, because I, I would say I'm on the side that yes, and some may scratch their head at that. Well, Maddie, you know, they they haven't showed the game off since that kind of failed reveal, and they've only shown pictures since then. And that's exactly my point, is they're talking a lot, but they really have yet to show. And while I was more excited about the Halo screenshots than Carrick or Dustin when we were on ham radio, fucking Dustin's become jaded too. Uh, even with that in mind, I still have to say that... Uh, oh, yeah, I forgot they, about they, that. Yeah, right. I, I, dude, I was fighting a war that episode, man. You were man. fighting that was, a war. That was you against the world on that one. I, I really was, man. That was a battle. But do you think there's enough conversation going on? Because I think there is for, for what's there. They, they Surprisingly, is being talked about a lot. I would agree completely. I think there's more than enough conversation for what we've been shown. Um, and like, we just won't know until more of it's shown. There's just not a lot shown. And what was shown, the conversation was negative because it was a negative showing. So like to me, it's commensurate. It's pretty, it's, I mean, what are you going to talk about other than everybody saying it doesn't look, it didn't look ready, uh, but that's been said. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, while, for example, you mentioned bigger campaign uh, play spaces and side content, that's great, but we need to see that really in action. We saw the bigger play space, and that was talked about. The side content, however, we don't know what that's going to be like in action. And more times than not, companies are going to show you the big thing, the important thing, not the side thing, so that the side thing can almost develop its own conversation and surprise people. Um, But... Yeah, ultimately, I think people are getting more optimistic about the game when when folks talk about it. I think they have the right things in place right now. You know, they did take that extra year. They do have the free to play multiplayer. Bringing on Joe Staten is is great. Uh, I yeah, do think opening sure, things great. up is good. Uh, so there are a lot of positive steps. I think people are anxious to see that re reveal, and Microsoft knows they need to get it right. Um, so, yeah, honestly, with me, uh, I think that th- it's getting enough conversation for where it's at, and in fact surprisingly not a lot of people are are shitting on it now like they were a couple months ago and that's kind of impressive to say given that they had a very bad showing and then only did screenshots since so to me that's a little something yeah true joseph loretti is our next write in have either of you been playing the outriders demo i think the demo is going to help this game sales wise everything from the demo carries over into the game upon release i personally have been having a blast and i hope more companies start releasing demos like these people can fly have definitely earned my money with this game so let's talk about outriders a little bit i don't agree <laughs> At all, I, but I, I well, I don't agree on if it being it, it, on it being that good, but uh, it certainly demos help. I mean, because people don't need a perfect game, like they need a fun mm-hmm. game, and I think there's fun to be had with outriders as long as you have the pre warning that a demo or a review is. I don't think people realize that like a demo and a review can sort of be the the alert. Hey, there's problems here in Surge. I talked mm-hmm. about the difficulty. You've talked about stuff in, in games that we suggest for. In fact, we're giving mini reviews when we are talking about, you know, like the the, the backwards compat or something because that's yeah. a, because we played them. So demos are great. So I would never say anything negative about the demo. It's just I came away from the demo far more worried than I was, especially now that I've played it some more. And there's one or two character classes that just don't feel ready at all compared to others Mm -hmm. and then the longevity of it i question um but that just might be me man 60 bucks might go farther these days you know because of covid 
people might just want to play a you know zoned out shooter yeah i i i keep saying it and i got to put time into the demo that's on me cuz now i've i've had some time open up and i have not leapt to it uh, i've been playing metal gear rising revengeance to be honest but why oh no revenge i'm sorry i'm sorry yeah, i know you were thinking i know you're thinking yeah, Fuck. I know you're yeah, thinking of dude, right away. I was like, there's no way you say why about that game. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Anyway, continue. No. <laughs> sorry. Um, I got to get around to playing the demo, though, uh, especially because I want to review this game. But when I previewed it back in August, it's funny because I really did enjoy it. And I feel like I, I have a good feeling about this game. I really do feel uh, it can create a good conversation at the minimum. And maybe I'm more invested in that than anything. Uh, but the reason is because it looks live servicey, but it is not... A live service game so their end game content they directly said we're not going to recycle or reuse anything now yeah. we will see that in action but to me that is very exciting now it does depend on the support provided and how they are going to create more afterwards but i gotta say this one felt good when i played it it's funny because this is where i need to play the demo right so just be aware of this i played a class uh the the ter what, what was it called the the technomancer or Technomancer and Trickster are the two T's. So you probably yeah. played Technomancer. Tech. I did Technomancer because it was the turret one. And yes. I liked that class. Right. Then a lot of people say that class sucks now. So it seems like something between my preview and demos has changed. And so that's worth noting. I have a... It could have been good back then and it is not great now. So that's why I want to go into Outriders. But right now, as I speak with just that impression experience and from what yeah. I've seen and read... I do feel good about the game because it is something that you and I have called for, which is, hey, we want a co-op game, not a live service game, a continuous world co-op. And I think there's a right. big difference there. So yeah, very big. My biggest concern with that game's level design. I felt like uh, the cover and the, the placement mm. of enemies, and sometimes they would shove you down a tunnel and then send eight gigantic enemies that can knock you back into it. And that was really frustrating, even though the game rewards aggression. It wasn't the... The idea they had was, oh, this will make them uncomfortable and they'll have to get mobile and really panic and it'll be a fun dynamic moment when instead it's like, yo, this is annoying. Like, I can't fight and I can't do what I normally would do and you fight with the camera and stuff. So there are flaws. This is not going to be a game that suddenly appears on, on Twitter and you see, wait, it got a nine? Unless... <laughs> I shouldn't say that too soon, but... Dude. It shouldn't. <laughs> don't say that too soon we we had to live through the medium which will forever be indelibly <laughs> burned into my of. fucking that's brain I dude i legit feel like i did not play you know how it is where sometimes you'll blow something out of proportion as a joke right you'll be like yeah, we do it yeah. with like we'll be like primal fucking worst game ever <laughs> so medium something is weird with that game i just don't get it i don't get it man I don't, I felt like I was off, you know, like I was just like, what's happening? And admittedly people hated it far worse than me and liked it far more than me. But the people who liked it and what they said, Maddie, what did they play? Cause that's not the game. It's I played. a mystery. We continue to solve. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this I, is one. I, I also now. believe the big thing though, for you is you played outriders where you were powered up a little bit and yes in the yes, demo yeah. your day one yeah so i would like to if if you might have a better opinion because you might go okay i know where we go and i mm. know now i know where we start mm. if that's the yeah. way you come out of it then that'll just give me more hope because then i'll be like okay maybe it evens out um yeah you know, i'll definitely goes. play it this weekend so. then and and update my opinion on it because i think it's pretty important for the conversation and it'll definitely create what i think is a good perspective on exactly what you were just talking about you know where it was where it is now and and maybe it is a scaling thing that i experienced so we'll see on that thank you joseph for writing in james kinslow the third is our fourth write in almost the last Kerrigus stated being a DD fan in previous episodes with DD and magic the gathering both being owned by wizards of the coast i must know if he and you maddie are magic the gathering fans i love the game and my most played color is green Either way, I hope you both have a very average day. I love this question. You and I talk a lot about the importance of analog games, of the card yeah. games, the board games, that type of stuff. Uh, so this gives us a little bit of a window into that where we had not previously been able to show our sides uh, or this side of ourselves, rather. Um, so, Carrick, I know you you are big on, on board games and everything. I mean, you can go for, for hours on this, but where do you stand on D&D, on &D, 
on Magic the Gathering. Are you a fan? I know D&D fan is D&D. awesome. Magic the Gathering fucking sucks. <laughs> fucking sucks. It's too expensive. Too it's expensive, too expensive, and I'm not a huge card game fan. So, like, I know you uh, like um, Dragon Ball, but right? Yeah. Not Yu Gi Oh! I got it right okay. this time. Dragon okay. Ball, yeah. And I like, um, there's various ones that I do like. It's just that Magic in particular, I don't. However, there is a new, not new, it's new to me. There is a type of Magic the Gathering game called Commander. And anybody I know now who likes Magic is most likely talking about this game mode, which does restrict some of the bloat that can occur with cards and the stuff I ran into. Now, I haven't played it personally, but every person I know, whenever I mention Magic, including Grimblade in your Discord, has mentioned, I think it's Grimblade, has mentioned uh, Commander as being, like, the legitimate Mm -hmm. way to play now. So, you know, I'm just not a fan of collecting thousands of cards and mini-maxing. I don't have the time, and uh, I didn't find their artwork good. You know, that's what's weird. Dude, I'm an artwork freak. So like, a ge- well, it's like a game. You'll look at a game right. and if the artwork looks, you know what I mean? And you'll be like, oh, it's not, it's not working for me for whatever mm-hmm. reason. I think that's what happened with magic for me. So, but yeah, everything I, else I, I, love. I started off with magic, <clears throat> I think four years ago, my buddy and I would just go to like card stores and just pick up packs and we ended up starting to play together. And, um, I liked the rhythm of magic, yeah. you know, tapping energy, placing yeah. cards. Yeah. That is my ideal way to play card games. Uh, But what happened is it just kept getting expensive. And I, I, there was something about it. I wasn't a fan of, I I felt like with a card game, what I like, and I'll explain the one I really do like is uh, not this one trick way to victory. So in that game, it was get your planeswalker on the field. And then like this, this, that for this specific build, like I don't like a direct path. I like flexibility and options and and side decks, uh, which of course magic does have side decks, I believe, but um, what I fell in love with was, and I, I highly recommend this to the audience. If you got friends who play card games is a dragon ball, super, the card game. And I know what you're thinking. Like what fucking best card game I've ever played. I played that shit. Carrick, remember when I was really in my prime, obviously COVID stopped this. I talked about that shit every week. I mean, takedown came on the podcast purely to talk about that. Technically. Yeah. It's and obvious that it's big. It is so good. So the way it plays is uh, a lot like magic. You lay down energy, you tap them, you play cards. Those energies are based off colors. But what's cool is that your battle cards are your energy. So you make choices in game of, it's not like, oh, I have a, 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 a tree or whatever they call it, a forest. And so that's my green energy or whatever it is. Instead, it's like, I have this red battle card that could be useful later in the game, or do I charge this now? Uh, it's also a very interactive card game. So there's defensive steps and offensive steps. So when you attack, your opponent can negate, counter, counterplay. Um, they've added so many different twists and turns to it where you can attack and it'll trigger this effect through your deck. You'll search a card, play it. When those two cards on the field, this one can come out. And so suddenly you have like eight cards on the board. And it's a very, like if if you nail your opponent down and you just get rolling, it's one of the best things ever. So I stopped playing for a little bit, not because I don't like it, I was praying for a digital version during the pandemic. Uh, they do have a, a a somewhat digital version where you can play on an app, which sucks. It uh, sucks. And it's just a tutorial. Yeah, it's terrible. Uh, they also have this thing called Untap. You can go online. You can take pictures of the cards and then play through that. Some people will connect their webcams. They'll show their desk and then they'll play that way. Oh. That's probably the best way to play it. But that's the game I've always played for years. I spent a lot of money on it, but I did not regret it. I, I really... I really support it. And sometimes I do buy cards from their new sets now just to make sure that they don't drop this game because I think it's legitimately good. They're 14 sets in, so it's seemingly doing well. People are buying it. They don't really, they have a good pacing of product release. I feel like they've picked it up a little bit too quickly lately, but pre pandemic, they were, they were really strong. So things are good for that. It's also affordable. It's still, you know, a card game. So some cards will be more like 30 bucks per card for some new ones now, but um those prices eventually go down and what's great is the meta is very flexible so you can kind of come in with a fun deck and and still compete which is great i i think that one also obviously because you like dragon ball but i think fiction matters and i don't like magic's fiction and so i did werewolf rage is what it was called based on the vampire the masquerade bloodlines game world they had one 
that was werewolf and I loved it because it was werewolves. I was like, dude, this fits for me. Magic, magic just didn't. And so like Dragon Ball fits even more. Strangely enough, though, I'm not an anime fan. Anytime oh, they the take a fiction, cards. whether it's the theme or what have you, it works. And they're lately one of the cool things about card games that have been happening is it's not just cards that are just blase. Green is green. Now, in like the, some of the card games I play, like Cthulhu or Elder Scrolls is what it's called, or Elder Sign, sorry. When you're playing this I was like, game, what? <laughs> yeah. When you're playing this game, every character actually has their own, they have their own cards. And then those mm. cards fictionally make sense. So you can't have two, more than two weapons because you only have two hands. And right. so you have like right. a flashlight and a fucking magic book, and you're in a haunted house. And it starts to feel like D and I always tell people it's like D and D light, even though almost more rules now in some of these games. But if you want to get somebody to play these games, like I would not tell people to play magic. I would say, honestly, the one you're talking about or um, uh, any of the like Grim, uh, I was telling Grimblade about um, Gloomhaven or Brimstone where they're 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 board games. But if you want to role play, you can. And I'm a big mm. believer in that because you might find somebody who loves board games, but then they get to role play their cowboy. You don't even say role play them, but they start going like, howdy, folks. And pretty soon you're mm. like, wait, does this person, are they okay with that? Because if they are, then they might make the step into D&D. &D and there's, there's yeah, something there's there. there's a lot of made, half steps. Magic doesn't work that way. I've never, I mean, most people I know who play Magic, it's green. It's like colors. There's not a, and they know the names like you did, but there's not a, it's rare. I'm sure there's people who love the fiction, but it's even the WoW game, by the way, is awesome. I played the WoW mm -hmm. fucking card game. Have you played that, Maddie? No, no, I've never heard of it. It's it's WoW. So you actually have like your orc shaman and okay. you get cards and you can do raids. You can do co-op so you can get like three person that's against awesome. a deck. That's <laughs> one of the ra they're called raid decks. So like you can play against each other if you want. But if you don't, you can literally play like against the game board with your character and their character. That's how far along these games have got it's. And I love the connection of character. I think that's like the biggest thing for me. So yeah, very cool stuff. Yeah. I'm glad people are doing it. Yeah. There's also, uh, I just wanted to toss in, uh, I think it's called mansions of madness. That's a good dude. Like, mansions of madness is elder scrolls, by the way, or elder oh. sign <laughs> Cthulhu. Okay. It is. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Cause that one is is that's tough. It's a hard game, but if you want to kind of pseudo role play, you can get yep. into your character and and make some pretty cool choices. And have it's, you guys won that? Uh, because dude, we, we got had our to, butts kicked. Almost yeah, no, game. no, we had to. I'm pretty sure we had to retry. Yeah, we had to retry a couple yeah. of times because it, that, it, yeah, yeah, that shit's hard. It, it's fun because, but that's Cthulhu. It's on purpose supposed to be about mm. dying technically but yeah. that's funny you played that i didn't the know insanity you that thing one. you're just constantly yeah. losing yeah. dude you're constantly like your guy's just a gibbering idiot by halfway through the game you're like what the yeah. fuck is going on yeah yeah i like it's that, hard though. to fall in love with because you're so confused because normally as you get deeper you get better but in this you get far fucking Correct. worse it's exactly <laughs> right you get you start out going like da, 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 da. i'm shiny new kid and pretty soon you're like drooling bad shit's happened and you're like dude yeah. i don't think this is gonna <laughs> work eight out. diseases and it's like yeah I'm yeah <laughs> Right, you're riddled with VDs. It's just like, hey, man, hope you enjoyed the game. It's a positive night. You know, everybody goes home all depressed. I'm just joking. They don't. But you got to know that type of game is different than the others. Yeah, yeah for sure. It's a fun challenge of friends. Mm -hmm. Brandon Hardman's our last write in for the show. On a recent episode of Sacred Symbols, Colin stated he would like to see Castlevania developed by FromSoft. I personally think a From developed game set in the world of Berserk would be dope. What property or IP would you like to see reimagined under a new dev and who would you like to see do it? Uh, so by the way, Brandon, go play Demon Souls because Demon Souls takes a lot of ideas from Berserk, just so you know, like a lot of them, uh, especially story wise, lore wise. Uh, that's been that's been something that maybe you didn't look into, uh, but that is definitely a thing. So give that a look if you have yet to. Um, I'm assuming maybe you have because you, you seem pretty invested in the FromSoft conversation, but just in case. Uh, for me, Carrick, I put it into the universe last week about Ninja Turtles. I said, we need a new yeah. fucking Ninja Turtles game. Because uh, what happened was someone said, where's the arcade games for Back Compact? Because there was the, the I think it was 87 arcade game or something like that. Uh, there was Turtles in Time reshelled. Uh, and then they had Out of the Shadows, the kind of Arkham style co-op yeah. Ninja Turtles game, which was really janky, but had a lot of potential. 
Um, and I put it out into the universe. Like, they need to make a new Ninja Turtle game. A week later, here we are. We have a new Ninja Turtle game. Really exciting stuff. I got to say, though, it was like a hesitant hype. I was like, this is great. Like, we have, it's not Activision. It's the Mercenary Kings devs. We got the publishers of Streets of Rage 4. This is good, right? Like, we yeah. have the right minds behind it. But on the other hand, I couldn't help but feel a little bit ticked. I, it might be the right word because I'm like, man, when is someone going to take a chance and do something bigger? Like make a a better Mutants in Manhattan. Make a open world Ninja Turtles game. Something more ambitious. So for me, I would love to see Rocksteady take the Ninja Turtle IP and make something. Something in an open world. I think that would be phenomenal. So it doesn't have to be from Soft. He says, what he property or IP soft. would you like to see reimagined under a new dev? And oh, who would you like to see do it? I see. So Rock, rock Steady. And Ninja Turtles would and be Ninja a Turtles. dream. Oh rock Steady God, did which Batman. of the Batmans? All of No, they did uh, all of them but Origins, right? Yeah. Is that how? Yeah. Or, yeah, okay. Okay. Even though I liked Origins, I was just making sure we were clear on that. Mm -hmm. um, dude, a game that got made and turned out awesome was Transformers Devastation. So if you had asked me hmm. prior to that game coming yeah. out, I would have said Transformers and Platinum, even though that game wasn't to the Platinum degree, it was like their B-plus team. It was better than Teenage Mutant and Korra. So, right. G.I. Uh, Joe. No, not G.I. Joe. What's a game world that I'd like to see? Castlevania's Dark Souls is what he said. Castlevania is all yeah. about speed and stuff. Like, the idea of Castlevania and Dark Souls is weird to me. I'd have to think that one through. Those games are Damn. really hard, though. Maybe that's why. Maybe, yeah. Oh, yeah, uh, okay. Hmm. Okay. A game? He wants a game? Uh, a he, property or, or IP you would like to see imagined under a new dev. So I'm assuming a game. It will never happen, but I would absolutely kill to see Altered Carbon done by, like, Rockstar. It'll never happen. Mm. I want a futuristic game by them. Altered Carbon's one of my favorite books ever, and then the TV show did a pretty good job. Not amazing, but it did a pretty good job. Um, did you ever see Altered Carbon? No, I know you recommended it to me. People have been suggesting that in The Expanse, I think, was another one I've been getting yeah, a lot Yeah, The Expanse, of. to me, is way slower, but I still enjoy it. Um, but Alter Carbon is a little bit more condensed, but it involves some crazy futuristic stuff. And, uh, yeah, I would love something hard noir. I'm a big... Well, like Prey 2. You were mentioning Prey 2 earlier, like it went away, like mm -hmm. it was almost made, and that was going to be a bounty hunter game. I had always oh, thought God. to myself, what if it was, like, hard sci-fi instead of... Japanese run the world sci-fi like that's the way sci-fi right now is it's themed like we talked about this with cyberpunk it's like really it's just cyberpunk they didn't do a great job on like the punk part or or the cyber part really I want to <laughs> like I would love to see a really in-depth hard cyberpunk style game and I think Altered Carbon would be it that would be awesome you never know with those though because the ones you and I would suggest probably aren't big enough uh like what do you call it IPs. Well, you, yours was. Mine was. Yeah, absolutely. So, great picks overall. I gotta watch those shows. Do you know how many seasons are in? Altered is only one season for the Prime, and then it's a character who changes bodies for every season. So oh. the second season is a completely different actor. Interesting. Um, the guy who played. Uh, oh, you don't watch Avengers movies, do you? You did. No, I did. You... The Avengers. The uh, the, the metal flying dude. Uh, the black actor, he's Falcon? awesome. He's uh, Falcon. The, um, yeah, Falcon. I forget his um, name. He plays his in name. the second season, um, but it's ve very futuristic, dude. Virtual realities in people's heads. It's like you have to, you can't do what I think you may want to do, which is sit down and be like, hey, let's watch a show and eat some popcorn. You actually, that one you really have to watch. So it may not, may not be a big, a big perfect, you know, leap for you. Yeah, that's one I want to check out though. But that's it. That's all we got for this episode. Carrick, our longest one yet, certainly deserving of the topic. Is it? Yeah, two hours, 37 minutes as I look at our recording. Pretty, uh... <sighs> my pretty clock lengthy. stopped, bro. Oh, wow. Do you know what my clock says? 
eleven oh five, and it's three. So I was like, "What's he talking about? Did we start early or what?" Oh, okay, gotcha. Nah. Yeah, it is longest. <laughs> I wish it was three for me. It's six. I'm starving. So <laughs> yeah, no shit. I'll let I'll, I'll let you go. But yeah, long one. But um, awesome. This is a cool time to see what everything that's going on, and I, I I'm actually excited uh, for what Sony and Nintendo also do. I think it's going to be really cool to see what goes on. Right on. I agree. All right, well, we hope all of you enjoyed episode 10 of Defining Duke. We hope to see you all next week as uh, we continue to grow this show. I imagine this one will do well. So if you're new here, we hope to see you stick around and uh, we'd really appreciate that. Uh, and so with that, uh, it's time for us to sign off. Carrick, any final words? No, make sure to check out our stuff as well. ACG on YouTube. You can check out my patron and Matty's got a patron. Mr. Matty plays. Check him out. Right on. All right. And with that, we appreciate you. We hope you uh, enjoyed this episode. And we once again do hope to see you next week. All right. Take good care of yourselves. Have an awful week. And we'll see you then. <laughs> Peace out. The Finding Duke, an Xbox podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is recorded from the good old USA. The show was conceived by Matthew Mr. Matty Plays Schroeder and me, Colin Moriarty, and is written and produced by Matthew Schroeder. Matty's co-host is Jeremy ACG Penter. The Finding Duke's executive producer is Dustin Furman, and the show is edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's shows, including The Finding Duke, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer support level or higher on Patreon, and we're grateful for your kindness and generosity. 